most people don't like feeling helpless. Though it's not an active fear you might have, suffice it to say that the idea of being in a horrifying situation that you can do nothing about probably makes you feel pretty uncomfortable, or unnerved. There's a reason that the protagonists of horror films are often young women, a classification of person generally considered to be more vulnerable. Heroines like Laurie Strode, Sidney Prescott, and Nancy Thompson have become iconic. These girls found themselves in helpless situations and all managed to find a way out of them entirely on their own. We briefly touched on this theme of helplessness in the last chapter of Higarashi, but instead of just a side note, it becomes the main driving force behind the story in this chapter, and the horror comes from a rather unexpected place. Tatari Garoshi, or Curse Killing chapter, derives its terror from something that we haven't touched yet in this story. Reality. So far, the fear has been from curses, and sacrifices, demons, and ghosts. Not so in Tatari Garoshi. I won't go too far into detail yet, but you'll know soon enough. To those of you who decided to return, and those who for some reason decided to start with the third episode, why? My name is Hedgehog, welcome back to this nonsense, and this is Higarashi. Hello, hello, welcome back. No, I am not dead, just dreaming. These videos take an exceptional amount of time to make by myself, which just means I'm lucky that I'm not. As always, special thanks go to Claude, my associate editor, for taking the time to decrease my time. If I was able to pay him more, these could be out even faster, so if you'd like to see more of this fucking garbage, please consider having a look at my Patreon, because that essentially equates to the man's paycheck. Also, thank you to everyone who lent their voice to this video. All of their links are in the description. If you liked what they did, please go let them know, whether through their own social media presence, the comments below, or the Discord server. Seriously, join the Discord server or Alamis is gonna come for your kneecaps. Like always, I'm going to go over everything in this chapter, and I am once again asking you to read the chapter first. Hey, listen, if you don't wanna play the entire game, just keep up with me. We'll make it like a book club, yeah? I'm sure you can read way faster than I can make these things. Finally, there's one more warning I need to make, particularly for this chapter of Hikarashi and moving forward. Higarashi has never had a light storyline, but from here on out is where it starts to get real. I'm not going to go into detail so as to not spoil the whole thing, but just maintain caution while venturing ahead. Take care of yourself, yeah? Cause, uh, yeah, it's going to get real dark now, chief. Now, I know my audience. Some of you are hearing that and salivating, so without further ado, let's do it. I don't want to do it alone, so... Please follow me along the deep, winding path back into the mountains of Hinamizawa. It begins, as always, with a word from the author. Man? Curse? Or coincidence? How are the conjectures inside you solidifying? I look forward to whether those conjectures will waver or become a cornerstone in this scenario. The difficulty is the worst. You will probably not even be able to make conjectures. As usual, we are greeted with a poem by the illustrious Frederica Burncastle before cutting away to something unexpected. Not even a slight breeze was blowing. There were various articles of clothing hung out to dry in the messy apartment windows, but the lack of wind evoked an impression far removed from coolness. We're back, of course, in the hot early summer of 1983, but it doesn't seem like we're in Hinamizawa. A landlord approaches one of his tenants, who is complaining of a horrible smell. When the landlord goes to investigate the drainage ditch behind the building, he thinks that it must be rotting refuse, or maybe the corpse of a small animal. What he doesn't expect to find is a human body. Identity of the deceased. Unknown. Sex. Female. Naked, too? Figuring out who she is will be rough. Her stomach was cut open and her intestines pulled out. The police expect Yakuza or triad involvement. Well, Ryukishi, you're not even trying to hide it anymore, are ya? And honestly, I think that choice was for the best. Right away, we're given not a relaxing atmosphere, but an odd sense of foreboding. This chapter is sinister from the start, indication that the kid gloves have come off. This will make even the calmest scenes tense in a way that is impossible to describe. 
and there will be plenty of those because now it's time for happy club times. That's right, after that cold open, it's back to our average everyday life in Hinamizawa. The most relaxing time during the school day? Lunch, for sure. Everyone brought their desks side by side like always, and we all ate together. Oh my, Nian-san, if I may say, your lunch looks quite appetizing today. There are so many different things. It's wonderful. As usual, our main cast are all enjoying their lunch together. Mion's is somehow very pretty despite being full of leftovers from her relative's drinking party the other night. Rena's is gorgeous and full of love. Rika's and Satoko's are filled to the brim with grilled meat, and Keiichi's is made by his mom. Or at least that's what's implied considering that the only food he knows how to make is cup noodles. But wait, this reminds him of something. Come to think of it, this morning. I think my mom was saying something really import. Uh. Uh. Ah! As it turns out, Keiichi's parents are leaving town for the next few days for Tokyo, and they have forbidden Keiichi from eating out, as they want him to learn how to cook for himself. But when they told him this, he was half asleep. Yep, yep. I'll get by. I'll get by. No, I won't! Keiichi doesn't even know how to use a rice cooker. I mean,. Come on, even you know how to use a rice cooker, right? That's such an everyday tool! Okay, I mean, it is for me, but I'm kind of a freak and rice is cheap. And it certainly is in Japan! When his friends ask him about that curry he made for the curry contest that was apparently really good, take a note, that happened in this timeline, he responds that that is literally the only thing he knows how to make. He calls it junk food, which summons their teacher, Chie Sensei, a known curry freak. She leaves, thankfully, a second later. Okay, chan you can disparage other foods all you want, but you might want to stay away from curry. Back to the topic at hand, for Keiichi, it's a matter of surviving on cup noodles alone or learning how to cook. Why can't you just try to cook for yourself? Rice you make yourself is really good! You're right. If I don't understand how to cook a few things around here, then I won't be in good shape the next time our club does a cooking showdown. That clever trick of yours in the last curry contest won't work every time after all. And what are you so relaxed for? You relied entirely on Rika-chan back then, didn't you? Satoko asserts that she actually can cook and promptly gets disparaged by the rest of the gang until Rena stands up for her. Keiichi says that even he would never lose to Satoko, which she takes as a challenge. I might not seem like a good cook, but I take turns with Rika, you know? Good for you for being able to cook. I'll buy some candy for you as a present later. If you're going to act so smug, then you can surely show us something better than Satoko. Uh-oh. This is starting to sound like a club activity. Of course it is. Mion proposes a bento competition. Whoever brings in the best bento box tomorrow wins. Whoever loses, well, they have to tell Chie-sensei they hate curry. To her face. Yeah, you're on! My bento tomorrow will knock you right out of your shoes! Keiichi, you dumb, dumb bastard. On the way home, of course, he panics, realizing that he's never going to be able to pull this off. And like always, Rena is scarily perceptive and calls him out without him even telling her. She tells him to do his best and that he can call her if he's stuck, but only after he really tries first. You were grandstanding so much to Satoko-chan that you have to try your best. Hey, about Satoko, how good is she at cooking? <laughs> She's at least better than you. Needless to say, though he tries, cooking does not go very well for Keiichi. He can't even cook from a recipe. First off, it calls for three teaspoons. But which spoon is that? Oh boy. Eventually, he fucks up so bad that he causes a gas fire that nearly reaches to the ceiling before he realizes what he's done. How did this happen? Oh, because he dumped a bunch of veggies in a wok and then filled it to the brim with salad oil. Wait. What? Could I... Could I have been... doing something insane? Yeah! What in the world are you doing? You must stop the flames this instant! Of all people, it's Satoko who comes to the rescue. And Rika too, of course. They douse the flames, and the only thing Keiichi can say is... Wait, what are you doing in my house? You're trespassing on private property! Asshole. Yes, well, Keiichi-san even caught red-handed in the act of arson! 
It would be very, very sad if Keiichi was homeless after this. So as it turns out, Rika and Satoko came over to check on his cooking, and whether to make fun of him or help, it's a good thing they did. Satoko and Rika point out that in addition to the vegetables, he fucked up on the rice and miso soup as well, which means that ultimately, Keiji didn't succeed in making anything for himself. Hmm, this seems like a metaphor for something. After poking fun at Keiichi, Satoko sighs and tells him to leave everything to her. He thinks she means the cleanup, but after, Rika pulls him out of the room and he hears what sounds like Satoko cooking. Was Satoko... was she cooking? Satoko wanted to show you that she can cook proper meals too. Keiji eventually pokes his head back in the kitchen, and Satoko gives him a couple of cooking tips while Rika sets the table. When he checks in on Rika in the living room, she seems really happy, unlike Satoko, who's being super serious about all of this. Satoko isn't in a bad mood at all. She's enjoying herself more than she has in a long time. She's like how she was when her Nini was with her. What in the hell is a Nini, and can you eat it? As it turns out, Nini is short for Onichan, or brother, for those of you who spent less than two seconds watching anime. Onichan, Onichan, Onichan. He's named Satoshi. Haven't you heard his name before? Oh yes, we certainly have. Several times at this point, actually. In fact, just last chapter, didn't we learn something interesting about Satoshi? Someone made him disappear, even though he wasn't abusing her. The police judged him to have run away from home, but Satoshi-kun wasn't the kind of person who would do that. It's been a couple of months, so let me catch you up quick on everything we know about Satoshi. He's Satoko's older brother, and he had a lot of weight on his shoulders. It seems that he and Satoko may have been in a less than ideal home situation after their parents died. Satoshi also attended the school in Hinamizawa, and it seems like he might have been a part of the club. One day, he started acting strangely and brought a bat to school before suddenly disappearing. Now Satoko and Rika live together instead. According to Rika, Satoko liked to scold her older brother as a way of supporting him. And Keiichi realizes something. We have me, unreliable, unable to cook even a single dish properly. And Satoko, who redid it while scolding me. Could Satoko have been... getting a glimpse of her brother, who now live far away, through me? Today, she was the one. She suggested we should go to Keiichi's house. She said, there's no way the unreliable Keiichi-san could possibly make dinner. It turns out that Satoko didn't come here to belittle him. Well, okay, maybe a little, but to help him. Rika, it's time for dinner! On the table was a truly firm, family-oriented dinner. It was a daily meal, the sort a housewife would make. It was very nonchalant and brimming with liveliness. The three of them sit down at Keiichi's table and have a very nice dinner together. I may lie to you, Satoko. You've beaten me soundly. Oh ho ho! Do you have a better opinion of me now? I may still not be as good as Rika or Renaissance, but I can cook far better than the helpless Keiichi-san. Yeah, yeah, I know better now. The food is delicious. Satoko and Keiichi go back and forth a little as usual before Rika changes the subject. When we eat rice like this, it's fun, like we're eating with Satoshi. How <laughs> nostalgic. I wonder what he could be doing right now. Satoko seems convinced that, even if he's been gone for about a year, he'll be back soon. Well, I'm sure he'll pack up shop at some point and return out of the blue. Keiji is worried that Satoko might be sad about her brother, but she actually looks rather cheerful. Keiji pats her on the head. I misunderstood you, Satoko. I didn't know you were this level-headed. They have a nice dinner and laugh a lot. Finally, it's getting late, and Rika and Satoko decide to head home. He offers to walk them back, but the two girls decline. Uh-oh. The lights are off. Are they sleeping? Nah, it's fine. This is the first half of the chapter, after all. Satoko instructs him on everything he needs to do between now and school in the morning like she's his mother, and he takes it with a chuckle. They turn to leave, but Rika comes back for a second. Keiichi, you get 100 points for today. Satoko probably felt like her Nini had come home. I think she was having a lot of fun. She asks him if he will go along with her scolding every once in a while, just like she used to with Satoshi. It's cute, for sure, but there's something nagging at me about that. I can't replace Satoshi, but Keiichi could do it. That's one less piece of baggage I need to shoulder. Rika speeds off into the night, leaving Keiichi to ponder what she just said. Like I said, this seems important, but we're gonna put a pin in it and come back later. For now, I'd like to talk about this first day for just a moment, because it's very different from the previous two. 
Both of the first halves of chapters 1 and 2 were filled with raucous comedy moments, full of outrageous club activities. While there is, of course, a club activity in this chapter, the mood is instead more quiet, more thoughtful. It seems like Ryukishi doesn't feel the need to rely on the club scenes as filler so much now. We're plenty familiar with the characters, so now is the time to start diving deeper into their backstories and psychology. Instead of the group scenes acting as mindless fun, they are instead beginning to facilitate these character moments. I wish this had happened a chapter earlier, but it's a welcome change. This way, you can still include the slice of life elements the first half of these chapters are known for, while also already doing setup for the second half in the background. Because I'm sure I'm not the only one who, despite the peaceful atmosphere of this first day, was still at the edge of my seat, realizing all of the different ways that this could go horribly wrong. All I have to say, I never could have guessed the direction this chapter was actually going to go. Lunchtime the next day quickly arrives, and all of the club members are anticipating the bento contest. In order to judge fairly, Mio decides to get the rest of the class involved by having them judge each bento's appearance and mark their three favorites down on a piece of paper. Of course, Keiichi's was made by Satoko last night, but he's not going to breathe a word of that so as to not get disqualified. Mion goes first, and holy guacamole, it's so good that I can't even show you because your eyes would pop right out of your skull! Or they... they just didn't want to draw it. It can't be. It has to be a lie. Such purely Japanese cooking. Mion. Mion Sonazaki couldn't possibly make this. <sighs> Keiichi never learns, does he? We just had a whole damn chapter about this. <laughs> just who do you think this old man is? Given enough time and ingredients, I could even reproduce the Manchu Han Imperial Feast. <laughs> Next up is Rena, and everyone is muttering in excitement. Rena's bentos always look gorgeous by default, so what if she actually tries? <laughs> Thanks, everyone! I'll reveal my bento now! <coughs> Rena's is much homier than Mion's, with an impressive amount of food. Another high scorer, for sure. Rika and Satoko are next, and though their toppings are a bit rough, it's so clear that they put their heart and soul into it that you just want to mash their little cheekies! Keiichi is impressed that they still managed to make their own bento after making him dinner, but wait. It turns out that they actually coerced their classmates, Tomoda and Okamura, you remember those guys, right? To give them half of their bentos. Sneaky. Finally, it's time for Keiichi. He feels a little bad since he didn't even make it, but as the anticipation builds, he rips off the lid and... Well, I mean, I want to acknowledge how hard you tried, but for this showdown, it doesn't matter. Aw oh, man, she just totally dissed Satoko's bento! Satoko proceeds to make fun of his bento as well, but it's clear that she's a little upset by everyone making fun of it. But that bento is just so ridiculous, I can't help but laugh! Even Tomoda and Okamura get in on it, doing my job for me and analyzing the composition of the bento, even claiming that it lacks spirit. It looks like Keiichi is about to be declared the loser, but he can't just let all of Satoko's hard work go to waste. OBJECTION! My bento was defeated because it lacks spirit. That's how you explained it. Am I wrong, Okamura-kun? Okay, listen, the first Ace Attorney game actually predates Higurashi by two years, so you cannot tell me that this whole upcoming sequence, even down to the way that line was just written, is not a huge fucking reference. Mr. Wright, say what you will, the evidence in this report is undeniable. The whole classroom suddenly morphs into a courtroom, with Tomoda and Okamura as the prosecutors, Keiji as the defense, and Mion as the judge. She might be a little less of an airhead than that guy, though. Keiji shows off the minor burns he got from the fire last night. That's right. I lack skill. But I didn't run away. I fought. And I delivered these results. Is that not spirit? I see. I understand your feelings, my Barasan. However, if spirit was all that mattered in cooking, the world wouldn't need chefs. It only means something when the other person feels that way. Does your bento make us feel that way, Mayabara-san? No, it doesn't make me feel that way. The girls in the classroom are supporting Keiichi, and the boys are supporting Okamura and Tomida. They get so loud that Mion has to call for order. The courtroom scene gets more and more absurd as it goes on. Keiichi calls Rena as a witness, the prosecution uses metaphors to back up their points, and all the while Mion is overruling objections. Eventually, the whole thing devolves into shouting by the jury. Mion finally calls everyone to order. Now then, do the defendants have a response to give? K 
Keiichi makes his final statement. He even uses a little backstab and calls Rika out for having hers made by Okamura. Ultimately, this means she's disqualified and Keiichi doesn't have to do the punishment. Satoko feels bad, however, and joins her. And then, finally, Keiichi comes clean as well, and the three of them all trudge down to the teacher's office to tell Chie-sensei that Curry sucks. All's well that ends well. See, I love this scene. And you might be saying, but Hedgehog, you didn't like the cutesy club scenes from the last two chapters. What gives? With a couple exceptions, the club activity scenes, especially in chapter two, were just pure fluff. They didn't have a lot to do with the main plot or character development beyond maybe the use in metaphors. But your average reader isn't going to think to themselves about the intricate meaning behind each club scene and how it metaphorically relates to the horror plotline of the second half. This scene, on the other hand, directly relates to Keiichi and Satoko's budding friendship. The whole scene is about Keiichi defending Satoko's cooking, even when she herself is not. Even though it's plenty goofy and loads of fun, it still has some kind of obvious meaning, which makes it not seem like a waste of time. This is a high bar Ryokishi is setting for himself here, but if I remember correctly, the club scenes will for the most part retain this level of quality throughout the rest of the story, so you all can stop hearing me complain about them! Yay! After school, Keiichi and Satoko decide to go shopping and make dinner together again. Satoko is very loud and proud, giving Keiichi plenty of tips about supermarket shopping. Hey, why don't we go with this economy size pack? Keiichi-san, you have no financial sense! For boys your age, it's wiser to choose quantity over quality! A man's heart desires both quality and quantity. Why can't you understand that? No matter the size of a man's heart, his wallet won't be any bigger! As they walk home, Keiichi ponders his changing relationship with Satoko. Up until now, they've acted purely as rivals, but now after spending time with her, he's feeling a much more brotherly bond. It was like our relationship had become a little bit happier, a little bit more charming. Was she lonely and projecting her older brother Satoshi, who hadn't returned home, onto me? Now that I'd been playing the role of her brother, I'd discovered that she really could smile so sweetly, but I wasn't Satoshi Hojo. I couldn't become her brother. I could come close, but I could never really get there. That was... vaguely, somehow, a little sad. Keiji shakes himself and thinks that there's nothing wrong with filling in for Satoshi, at least until he comes back. He decides that even if he can't become Satoshi, he wants to become a replacement brother. This is a nice sentiment to have, and shows some maturation on Keiichi's part. He expresses a wish for these happy days to never end, and I can't wait for this to go terribly, terribly wrong! They get back to Keiichi's place, eat dinner, Satoko sets a trap for him to step in, good times. Eventually, towards the end of the night, Keiichi gets a call from his parents. Turns out they'll be home tomorrow. Both he and Satoko are a little sad because this means their nightly meals will end. But despite her protesting, Keiichi just promises that next time he'll come over to her house. He bikes Satoko home, and the two of them bid each other goodnight. And for once, between the two of them, everything is peaceful. For now, of course. Saturdays in Hinamizawa are half school days, so of course, today Mion has big plans for the club after school. Unfortunately, Keiichi can't attend right away because he has to go to a professional lunch party his parents are holding for his dad's art colleagues. His father has always kept his work a little private, and now we can finally see why. As Keiichi talks to some of his dad's hangers-on, we as the audience at least come to the revelation that Keiichi's dad is actually... a doujin artist? <laughs> well, now we at least know where Keiichi gets his perverted side. Luckily, Keiichi gets a phone call that lets him gracefully dip out of the party, and it turns out to be Satoko. Keiichi-san, when are you gonna be able to come? Oh my. It's a real battle. This is a terrible crisis. At this rate, we're going to lose. KG comes to the conclusion that the gang has somehow gotten themselves into a fight, a thought which is only justified when Satoko asks him to bring a metal bat. He unfortunately can't find a bat, but a golf club should work just as well in a fight, right? It worked in Persona. He scoots over to the Okinomiya Elementary School as fast as he can. Meeting up with Rika on the way, they dash into the field out back. Come with me, Rika-chan. I will show you what the mighty manly warrior Keiichi Maibara can really do. How very excellent. I will give you a pat on the head. I can't wait to see your golf club rampage. Yeah, so they get to the field and it turns out, of course, that they're playing baseball. And for some reason, there's a lot of sports journalists around? 
So after a minute of hilarity and confusion, the club members explain the situation. It turns out that they ended up filling in for a couple of absent players in the local Little League game, the Hinamizawa Fighters, so they could have their grudge match against the rival team, the Okinomiya Titans. Unfortunately, halfway through the game, a professional level player, well, nearly, he's, he's still in high school, who happened to be a former member of the Okinomiya Titans, came by and saw his team losing, so he joined in as a pitcher. In a Little League game. So, yeah, he's throwing 90 miles an hour fastballs at little kids' faces. Not cool. It's the bottom of the ninth with one player on first base, but the Hinamizawa Titans are losing 6-7. to seven. Of course, if you mess with the club, you're in fucking trouble. And Satoko is last up to bat. Of course, it seems like she's got a plan. <laughs> See? You feel like we can win now, right? They don't tell us what this plan is, so of course it's going to succeed. Mio gestures to the umpire that Keiichi's going to take her place as the batter before Satoko, and they all jump into action. While the asshole pitcher, whose name is Kameda, goes to take a leak, Keiichi follows him and plops right on the urinal next to him. Now, I may be somewhat ill-informed about the specificities of male bathroom etiquette, but from what I'm aware of, this sort of thing is referred to as a power play. Now, you might be wondering, what on earth is Keiichi planning to do? <laughs> Why, kink shame the pitcher into letting them win, of course. What else would you expect from Keiichi? As it turns out, Kameda has a fetish for, of all things, cutesy desserts, and Keiichi takes full advantage of this. Do not cry, Kameda. What's wrong with a man being a pervert? I've been deeply moved by what you've shown me. Starting tomorrow, I'll be able to enjoy my desserts in a completely different way. For example, Strawberry shortcake. It's somehow old-fashioned, like the orthodox maids from the gaudy times of the late 1800s. Not those flirty maids with the short skirts that we have now. It's just strawberries. But please, master, I could not prepare any more than this, so please give them a taste. Because there are only strawberries. The soft, accented cream decoration ends up looking like frills, laces, and embroidery. Can I just be the first to say, this is stupid? But why am I laughing so hard? Keiichi asks Kameda to throw the game, and in exchange he'll get him an all-you-can-eat dessert pass from Angel Mort for an evening. Of course, having been broken down and then built back up again, the brainwashing cycle is complete, and Kameda will follow Keiichi to the ends of the earth. Back at the game, after making a big show of it, Kameda lets Keiichi walk, and then of course Satoko's up to bat. First, Kameda throws a fastball at her, then, all according to plan, tells her that he'll throw her an easy one since she's so real. Also, since Satoko has failed to hit a single ball that day. Of course, as it turns out, Satoko has been planning this from the beginning, including her earlier inability to hit a ball. Turns out, she's fantastic with a bat and hits a clean home run, giving the Hinamizawa fighters their victory. Both Keiichi and Satoko are highly praised, and Rika gives Keiichi something very important. A nickname, one that will follow him for the rest of the series. He is a magician of words. That's cheesy as shit, but I love it. The umpire, who it turns out was the coach for the team, comes over to congratulate them. Well, I never... You actually won. I... I'm shocked. He sounds so put out because it seems that he promised the team that if they won, he'd buy them a huge fancy barbecue. Irie's big wallet will be so sad. So sad. You're right about that, but I did make a promise. Coach, get some grade A beef like you promised. We won't forgive you if you buy nothing but vegetables to keep it cheap. Oh, yeah, they kind of forgot to introduce KG to the coach who shakes his hand. His name is Kiyosuke Irie. And can I just say, for this story, he's surprisingly normal. Mmm, what smooth hands you have. I must strictly instruct our maids to take good care of their skin as well, and punish the ones who don't. Yeah, so of course he's a weirdo who's obsessed with maids. I promise you though, this is a gag. He's actually harmless and gets along with the kids really well. Our coach is a little strange, but he's really funny, you know? You know? Thanks, Rena. Couldn't have put it better myself. The next day sees Keiichi and the gang attending the aforementioned barbecue, which is being held at the Furude Shrine. The gang jokes around a little, and then the barbecue begins with a little speech by Irie. We won a huge game yesterday. This is to celebrate that victory. As promised, I got a ton of delicious meat for everyone. 
eat as much as you want, and use that energy on our next game. He's not a particularly elegant speaker, but he got the point across. The group breaks into various conversations, everyone congratulating each other, and Keiichi notices that Satoko has garnered a pretty large group praising her for her game-ending home run. She was the leading actress today, so I decided not to bully her at all. I didn't care which it was. Her smiling happily, or making a big lively fuss like this. Just as long as she would keep smiling like this forever. She looks like she's having fun. Quite a lot of it. Hirie approaches Keiichi, and as always when Irie is around, they have an interesting conversation. Coach, you seem to like Satoko a lot. Yes, I do like her. I think Satoko deserves more praise for that crazy home run she got. I honestly didn't think she had it in her. Satoko-chan's older brother was more the quiet bookworm type. She probably inherited the opposite skill set. I think this is the first time in the series so far that someone has willingly brought up Satoshi. Keiichi takes the opportunity to ask Irie about Satoshi, and he mentions as well that he transferred, even though Keiichi knows that he ran away. He subtly calls the coach out, which nets him a bit of extra info. Something unfortunate happened. A few things, actually. As we learned back in Chapter 1, Irie informs us that Satoko's parents were in an accident and fell off a bridge. Now, Satoko's living with Rika. We get the feeling that there's some more stuff in the middle that we're missing, but Irie doesn't go into it. Going on living without the protection of parents is very difficult for kids that age, I think. Furude-san is particularly beloved by the older people in the village. As long as she's here, she won't want for much. Satoko-chan doesn't have it the same way. Keiichi ponders this, realizing that the death of her parents and Satoshi's disappearance are probably making it much more difficult and hurting her even more than he imagined. Was I thinking that her smiling meant that she wasn't hurt? That she didn't feel lonely? I've seriously considered adopting her. The only problem is that this is the 80s, in Japan, remember? If you're not married, you can't adopt a kid. <laughs> oh, what a shame. Didn't take long for my plan to get her to call me Papa hit a setback. Fucking nutcase. Though it's obvious that he's only saying it to lighten the mood. Irie kind of seems to be a thoughtful person like that. It's clear he cares very deeply for Satoko, and that makes him and Keiichi allies. Irie becomes someone he can trust. The two of them make a promise. That they will never make Satoko cry. Just hypothetically. If you did adopt Satoko, what would you do? Well, first I would get her to call me master and re-educate her in the ways of a maidservant. Keiji is initially disgusted, but wait, that's not Irie, eh? That's right, she's back. The bitch is back. <laughs> and it turns out she's been listening to basically their whole conversation. This time around, Keiji already knows who Shion is, but they've only met once. Shion-san, you came! I was disappointed because I thought you wouldn't make it. As it turns out, Shion is the manager for the Hinamizawa Fighters, or was? It's complicated. She's still technically the manager by name, but she hasn't been showing up to practices or games in the last year. Mion arrives right on schedule before we can get any real info, and the two sisters bicker over Keiichi before Mion drags him off to play a game with the whole group. This time, however, we don't actually get to see what they played, and instead cut away to afterwards, when Keiichi is helping the rest of the losers clean up after the barbecue. It is, of course, implied that at some point in the future, he will be put into one of Angel Mort's maid outfits and serve the rest of the club members, but we are mercifully spared that image. The coach puts Keiichi to work washing plates, and Shion follows behind to give him some cleaning supplies. They talk about this and that, and eventually the topic of conversation shifts from Satoko's amazing home run to, again, Satoshi, whom Shion apparently knows. You just moved here this year, didn't you, Kei-chan? You wouldn't have ever met him. Never met him, but I know a little. After their parents passed away, he transferred to a different school, right? Transferred? Who said anything about that? You said that because you asked someone, right? Who did I ask? I don't really remember. Even so, he transferred, so that's it, right? Not like there's a problem with it. There is one. Does that mean there's a record of his transfer? To another school? And that someone saw it? Or heard about it? Shion is being oddly stern about this. She seems to realize it as well, for she relaxes a little, but 
ask Keiichi to not say that he transferred when he doesn't know anything about him. Weird, but okay. We had no idea that Shion and Satoshi were even acquainted. Once again, just as Keiichi is about to ask her more, she distracts him and disappears. Like I said, what a bitch. The barbecue breaks up, and the gang goes their separate ways. As usual, Keiji walks home with Rena and Mion, but he feels an odd sense of disquiet about all these mixed messages he's getting about Satoshi. Quite without meaning to, he blurts out a question to Mion and Rena. Once again, they try to repeat the line that he transferred, and once again, Keiji calls them out. You might recall something similar happening in Chapter 1, but now that Keiji actually knows a little more, he gets Mion to stop being so Keiji, and she and Rena agree to tell him a little. They both seem pretty reticent, though, and Keiichi kind of regrets asking. It's okay, Mion. Let's stop talking about Satoshi. Sorry for teasing you. He won't come back. Already? It's starting already? The police did an investigation. Um, Satoshi had been earning money at a part-time job and had some put aside, and they learned that on the day he vanished, he withdrew it all. And then, at Nagoya Station or something, they spotted someone who looked a lot like Satoshi. I think that's a lie. Satoshi Kun didn't run away. Stop it, Rena. Because it was Oyashiro Sama's curse. I think, somewhere deep down, Satoshi Kun was probably thinking about abandoning Hinamizawa and running away. And Oyashiro Sama wouldn't allow that. I SAID STOP IT! Mion hits Rena in the head, and she shuts up. I told you to give it a rest, didn't I? I try to be nice, but you're pushing me to my limits. The group are quiet until they reach the point where Mion normally splits off from the others. But today, Mion mentions that didn't Keiichi want to borrow some manga and that he should stop by her house right now? In a flash of brilliance for Keiichi, he somehow goes along with her, and Rena seems none the wiser as he follows Mion instead. They walk in silence for quite a while, until Mion finally speaks. We weren't trying to hide anything about Satoshi. It's just one of those things that we shouldn't mention, you know? I won't ask ever again. So could you tell me honestly? What on earth? This time around, Keiichi does know about Oyashiro-sama's curse, at least a little. But Mion tells him something that we didn't know before now. Satoshi's dead parents. They were proponents of the dam project. Yeah, so obviously Hinomizawa isn't the most affluent area around, and though we've been fed the story that the whole town stood unified against the dam project of four years ago, that's not actually the truth. The government in fact offered a lot of compensation money and some residents who were down on their luck wanted to take it and start a new life. Satoko and Satoshi's parents kind of allowed themselves to be vilified in order to be the face of the opposition. So, when they died, specifically on the day of Watanagashi, people started to wonder. I don't think I need to explain this, but for Satoko, her parents' accident and Satoshi running away, and all the business about Oyashiro-sama's curse, none of it's a very happy story, you know? That's why we're not mentioning anything about Satoko's family. Even if someone asks about Satoshi, we just lie and say he transferred schools. They wanted to protect Satoko's happiness. Her smile. Before she leaves, Mion tells him one more thing. Not only around Satoko, could you keep quiet about Satoshi with Rena, too? After a little prodding, Keiji gets her to say why Rena's so serious about the whole thing. Though Mion doesn't necessarily believe her, Rena believes that she is a former victim of Oyashiro-sama's curse. Wait, isn't the curse when someone dies and someone goes missing? Unfortunately, we're not given anything else on the matter as Mion says goodnight and leaves. As Keiichi heads back home, he can't help feeling an odd sense of disquiet. I would have to be more careful starting tomorrow. I would put all this unpleasant stuff behind me forever. But the more I thought that I'd be more careful tomorrow, the more I couldn't get rid of the ominous thought that I had already put an end to those enjoyable days with what I'd just done. After the conclusion of the chapter, we get a little more info about the female murder victim from the start of the story. Her name, it seems, was Rina, and she was somehow involved with the drug-dealing side of the Sonozaki family. Her death seems to be a punishment of some kind, but the twist is that she had a partner who's still very much alive, and who has been shacking up with her for the past year. His name? 
Tepe Hojo. Keiichi didn't sleep well last night, and with an odd sense of anxiety on his chest, he still has to make the trek to school. Now let's pull yourself together and get to school, and return to the fun, enjoyable days, where everyone laughs, plays, and just has a good time. I'll be nice to Satoko as an apology, too. He meets up with Rena, and she looks totally normal. Everything seems fine, he's just been worrying about everything changing for nothing. But then he gets to school, and Rika and Satoko aren't there. I'd only come to school to see their energetic faces, since I figured it would get rid of these feelings I have. But the load on my chest remained where it was. It wasn't very pleasant at all. Finally, just when the teacher arrives, Keiji hears feet running down the hallway. There they are. But only Rika comes through the door, looking downcast and saying that Satoko might be late. When the gang questions her, she's surprisingly reticent about it, but before they can really get into it, class has to start. As class continues, Rena whispers to Keiichi when the teacher isn't looking, asking him if he's feeling alright, and he tells her about his worries. She tells him that every day will continue to be fun, and he shouldn't worry about it, but he refuses to agree with her. She finally admits that she knows how he feels, and gives him a little advice. Like, if suddenly there was a volcanic eruption tomorrow and everyone died, if you were the only one who survived the catastrophe, Keiichi-kun, how would you feel? I imagine myself being that sole survivor in the ruins of Hinamizawa. Rubble and the bodies of friends lying in heaps at my feet. Was it sadder that all my friends had died? Or was it sadder that I couldn't have died with them? I didn't know which, but I'd probably cry a lot. And then, maybe you would think this. If this was my destiny, then I should have made sure every day before this was as fun as possible, so I had no regrets. Rena wants him to live each day at its fullest, so that when that sad day finally does come to pass, he can still remember all the good times that were unmarred by the bad. It's a good thing to do. Like Rena, I've definitely lived through bad times, and the only thing you can do when times are good is try to appreciate them while they last. Unfortunately for Keiichi, he's learning this a little too late. The group, San Satoko, sit down to eat lunch, and though the mood is initially dour, they try to cheer each other up and eventually succeed. Finally, Keiichi starts to feel a little better. Towards the end of lunchtime, Tomoda and Okamura ask Keiichi to get their ball off the roof for them since he's much taller, which he does with ease. He's about to head back inside, but... Hello there! Good day! Sorry for bothering you during your lunch break. Wait a second. No. This shouldn't be happening yet. Watanagashi hasn't happened yet, so why is Oishi approaching Keiichi? I've been feeling this for a while now, but I think you'll agree. This time, it's all happening way too fast. Those happy times that we thought we had before everything goes downhill, they're all slipping away faster than we thought they would. This is only day five, after all. Once again, Ryukishi is making us feel like we are Keiichi by ripping the narrative that we thought we knew from repetition out from under us, in a way that only visual novels can really do. Each time we hit that button to go forward a line, those happy days are slipping away from us a little more. Keiichi seems to think that there's something wrong here as well, because his reaction to Oishi's appearance is a lot more… extreme this time around. I felt less of a tremble, and more of a sense of dread. Like a caterpillar, brilliantly colored in garish, bilious greens, was crawling across my forehead. A feeling of disgust that neither itchy nor gross could describe as the frizzly, dreadful hair rubbed against my brow. Fucking Keiichi over here composing goddamn poetry. Oh please, excuse me. I'm no one suspicious. I assure you. <laughs> I'm Oishi from the Okinomiya Police Department. Wait, where did I put my card? Hmm, huh? And this, lads, is what we call obfuscating stupidity, and Oishi is the master of it. Alas, his disarming tactics won't put Keiichi at ease this time, and eventually he has to get to the point. Could I get you to call a friend of yours, if I may be so bold? A girl. Could you call Satoko Hojo for me? You fool! That's what Keiichi is already anxious about! He kind of panics, and though the police officer just needs to ask her a question or two, Keiichi shuts him down surprisingly fast. Um, you may need something from her, but I don't think Satoko needs anything from you. 
Could you please leave? Holy shit, Keiichi. I'm scared of you now. Oichi really doesn't like that response. He turns to some younger girls, and upon finding out that Satoko isn't even there, he asks them who Keiichi is. Oh, could you be the son of the Maibara family I've heard so much about? <laughs> I hear your father is a renowned artist. His works go on display twice a year in the Great Ariake Exhibition in Tokyo, don't they? Then there's your mother. She seems intelligent, too. She went to some girls' university, didn't she? At least, those are the rumors. And they say she's a cold person because of it. Did you know that? Keiji is scared as shit of this man who seems to have already done his research on him, and I am too. This is a side of Oishi that we've never seen before. If this is what happens when he takes the kid gloves off, no wonder no one in Hinamizawa likes him. Oishi grabs onto Keiji's shoulder and continues to threaten him. In a place like this, it would be far better not to make enemies, wouldn't it? Ow. Nobody wants to have a grudge held against them. There's nothing positive about making enemies. Would you mind leaving things at that? You're hurting him. Holy smokes, Irie to the rescue! Oh my! If it isn't Dr. Irie! It certainly has been a while since we were last in touch. Keiji doesn't think about it, but we're certainly going to. Oishi just referred to Irie as a doctor. Uh, come to think of it, isn't the local clinic named the Irie Clinic? Regardless, Irie and Oishi converse for a minute, Oishi threatening to come by and have another chat with him, and Irie telling him to get a warrant or fuck off. Oishi skulks away, and Irie takes Cage to the nurse's office in the school. Just like I thought. My gut instinct wasn't wrong. He would be the one. The one to bring unhappiness, misfortune, something that would ruin our peace. Luckily, it looks like Keiichi isn't actually hurt, which Irie mentions is the case because Oishi is used to doing things like that. Scary. Irie asks Keiichi what happened, and Keiichi tells him that Oishi was looking for Satoko. Does he still plan to cling to Satoko-chan? He's a persistent man, I'll give him that. Like a snake. It seems like this is not the first time Oishi has wanted to see Satoko. By a long shot. Irie realizes that Keiichi is new in town and decides to fill him in, so he tells him a little more about the supposed curse. Again, we, and Keiichi, already know some of this, but here's some more gap filling. When they lost their parents, Satoko-chan and her brother, Satoshi-kun, were given to their uncle and his wife to care for them. Their uncle was Satoko-chan's father's younger brother. Unfortunately, neither of the couple were people deserving of respect. Apparently, in addition to the town treating them like garbage after their parents became the scapegoats for the anti-dam proponents, their guardians did as well, keeping them in a small room and often taking their anger at each other out on the children. But then, of course, came the night of Watanagashi, when their aunt was killed and Satoshi disappeared. After that is when Oishi started showing up to talk to Satoko. People say that something bad will surely happen to those he gets close to. In Hinamizawa, they think Oishi is Oyashiro-sama's. Just then, the door opens, and Mion and friends run in to make sure Keiichi is okay. Upon hearing that Oishi is the culprit, Mion goes a little nuts. Damn! Damn it! Oishi! The teacher quickly trundles the students out again, and before he leaves, Keiji asks Irie what he was about to say. They think he's Oyashiro-sama's servant, because the rumors go that he decides the sacrifices for the curse every year. Whenever June came around, Oishi would start paying frequent visits to Hinamizawa. Four years ago, it was known that the victim of the dismemberment, rumored to be the sacrifice, had been seeing Oishi numerous times leading up to the incident. Keiichi starts to panic, asking if this is a joke, but Irie assures him that those are all just rumors. I hadn't said that because of the rumors of Oishi being Oyashiro-sama's servant. Or his contacting someone foreshadowing who would be the sacrifice that year. It was because the ominous hatred I felt towards Oishi was becoming more substantiated. More real. Sotoko hasn't been to school in three days. And everyone is pretty worried about her. All throughout this, it seems like Rika knows something, but she won't say. On the third day, Tomoda and Okamura approach Keiichi. 
it seems like they might know something. They take him to the back of the school, and Tomoda explains that his grandmother saw Satoko in her tofu shop in the middle of the day, not looking sick at all. And not only that, but that she was buying really expensive tofu, which doesn't seem right. That Okamura says that there's a rumor that Satoko's uncle has come back to town. Keiji doesn't really get a lot of time to process this, however, because just then, Satoko arrives. He essentially glomps her and then proceeds to grill her about where she was for three days. Oh, I do so apologize. I was just giving the house a good cleaning. We haven't used it for a rather long time, so everything was covered in dust. Huh? Satoko, what are you talking about? Why would you have to stay home from school to clean the house? Gosh, it is nearly lunchtime, is it not? I'm just starving. Yeah, okay, something's clearly wrong here. She seems really frail and distracted, and there's only one reason I can think of that she would be cleaning the house that hasn't been used. What Okamura said was true. Her uncle is back in town, and they have both come to once more reside in the old house. Getting inside the classroom, everyone is of course relieved, but all of Keiichi's friends sense the same disquiet that he did. Satoko and Rika go off to talk to the teacher in her office, and Keiichi proceeds to tell Rena and Mion everything he just heard from the boys, in exchange for any information they might have. Rena doesn't seem to know anything else, but Mion admits that she knew her uncle was back in town for a few days now. Why didn't you tell us that? I... I I'm sorry? Keiichi-kun, it's nothing to get angry about. You're scaring Michan. He apologizes and listens to what she has to say. Apparently, Tepe Hojo's relationship with his lover, whom he'd been living with, suddenly collapsed. Maybe because she's, you know, dead. So he came back to Hinamizawa. He found Satoko shortly after the barbecue and dragged her home with him. Why did he do that? Because he's a good-for-nothing parasite. He can't even cook by himself, much less do any cleaning. Ah, I see. So, he's basically kidnapped Satoko to make her his slave. Before you ask, we'll get into this later in much more detail, but he is entirely within legal bounds to just take her with him because he is still her guardian. I could see the answer clearly. Satoko was locked up at home and tormented into doing the housework. Of course, this brings up a worrying point. Things will be different now than last year when they all live together because... Satoshi-kun isn't here. Now Satoko has no one to protect her. The teacher returns and they begin afternoon classes, so there's no more chance to talk. After school, Mion attempts to rally morale by offering to let Satoko pick any game she wants to play today. I'm very grateful, but your feelings are enough. There are many things I need to do, so... Yeah, she takes off. The other club members sit in silence for a minute before Rena finally breaks it. Rika-chan, maybe you could tell us about it now? Is it really bad? Of course it's bad. Before, her and Satoshi were just caught in the middle of the adults fighting, but now Tepe is actively abusing her. Both Keiji and Rena jump into action, asking whether they can get the police and child welfare involved, but Mion explains that they already attempted to do that last year. So, what did they decide to do? Wait and see. The uncle really studied up on this stuff. By law, you can't call it abuse unless assault or child neglect has been established. No matter how mean you are, you wouldn't act so violent in front of other people. Nobody would. The welfare officer came back repeatedly, but never found any direct evidence. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, the two adults got more vindictive as a result. Satoko was like a doll that did nothing but breathe by the end of it. Keiichi hits Mion with a couple of different plans of action, but she turns down every one of them. Hitting Tepe with a child neglect accusation? <coughs> Unfeasible. Getting someone to adopt Satoko like Rikachan is with the mayor? <coughs> Who? Who among them can care for another human being? Keiichi is getting really upset now. Irie can't, like we already established, and no one else in Hinamizawa is really wealthy enough. Well, except for maybe one family. Right. What about your family, Mion? You always brag about how great it is being one of the three families or whatever, don't you? Uh, no, that won't happen. My... my grandma would never allow it. Normally you act like some high and mighty bigwig and now you're being all spineless? What the hell? Are you just gonna sit by and watch Satoko suffer? Th that's... 
No, I don't... But... But that's a, a different... A different story. How is it a different story? Your friend is in trouble. What are you if you don't rescue her? You're our president. Our club president. Save her. Save her from this crisis. If you don't save her right now, you're not her friend. You aren't even human. I don't know if you have any humanity in you. Are you listening to me, Mion? <laughs> Keiichi-kun, if Michan's family won't work, then what if we look for another wealthy family? I know someone in Hinamizawa who lives in a nice big house. Uh, who's that? Oh, come on. You've got a splendid family and you're leaving it out of things? My... my family... Uh, my family is... We're done already? That was pretty quick. Okay, great. Congratulations on solving the problem. Then are we done for today? I'm going home. Hooray, hooray. Say something, will you? Why am I the only one talking? Say something, you bastard! Are you listening, Keiichi Maribara? Holy shit. Rena's scary. Uh-huh. Keiichi apologizes to Mion and realizes that truly, at the moment, there's nothing they can do. The only thing that's possible is to wait and see. See? There's that theme of helplessness I touched on in the intro. Here it is! God, this chapter gives me so much anxiety! Speaking of anxiety, I think I can now get into the reason why this chapter breaks the formula the last two set down. In the previous chapters, the horror was always fictional, out of the realm of the everyday world. Teenage girls going psycho and killing people, demon possession, crazy murders and disappearances, and the weird shit will come back. But that's not really the purpose of this chapter. Tatari Garoshi deals with a very real horror, one that can happen, and does happen, to people everywhere. Child abuse is a very real, scary thing, and Ryukishi deals with it in a surprisingly mature way. Unlike the previous chapters where the horror is dramatized to hell and back, the real terror in this chapter comes from that simple phrase that Mion uttered, wait and see. The real horror here is not the abuse itself, although it is of course horrific, but the fact that regardless of what any of the characters attempt to do, there's nothing they can do to stop it. The government is inept and cruel and too bureaucratic to actually make an effective difference, and all of the characters are children. Children can shout and scream, but there's really nothing they can do to change Satoko's situation. And I think that of everything we've faced so far, that's the most terrifying thing of all. Keiichi decides to head to Satoko's house to see for himself how bad it is. A car happens to pull up alongside the house, and who emerges but Irie. Satoko herself then climbs out of the passenger seat, and Keiichi greets the two of them. Irie helps Satoko unload four big shopping bags from the back seat, which she was apparently meant to carry home by herself, and Keiichi is horrified to see that they are filled with sake and cigarettes. And what is Tepe doing while she's been sent off on a hard and tedious errand? Playing fucking mahjong with his buddies! He opens the window and peers down at the group below. Satoko! You left the heat on for the sake when you left, you halfwit. No thanks from him, I suppose. Upon seeing Irie, he invites the doctor to join him, and Irie, of course, declines. I'll pass, thank you. I just ran into Satoko-chan and gave her a lift is all. I'll be leaving now. Keiji is fucking pissed. After helping Satoko carry the bags to the door, Keiji notices that Satoko is covered in bruises. He's already been fuming, but now he loses it. He tries to scream, but Irie covers his mouth, so all he can really do is groan. I wrung absolutely everything out of myself. Even having lost my voice, I was still wringing it all out. Reluctantly, Irie and Keiichi say goodbye to Satoko. You looked a lot like my real Nini just now. My real Nini may not be here anymore, but I have another Nini named Keiichi-san. Irie offers to give Keiichi a ride home, and he accepts. On the way back, Keiichi thinks about his new role he's taken on as Satoko's protector, and stews in the frustration that he can't truly protect her like Satoshi could. So he asks the doc more about him, and why he ran away. Apparently, he started working a couple of part-time jobs in order to afford to buy Satoko a huge teddy bear for her birthday, but when the day arrived, something else happened. Satoshi-kun disappeared, and the police looked long and hard. After checking all over, they began to think that 
Maybe he'd used his savings to go to Tokyo. He saved up all that money so he could run away? He was that selfish? But how could he just leave Satoko behind? Yurie tells him that Satoko had the same thought, and came to the conclusion that she was a burden on her brother. So she's been trying very hard to learn how to be independent, so when he comes back, she can show him. Of course, considering the fact that people who leave the town seem to be inflicted with Oyashiro-sama's curse, most people consider Satoshi a victim. If that's not what happened, then I couldn't forgive him. He left on Satoko's birthday, a few days after their aunt had been killed and their uncle had skipped town. They were in the clear. So why then? Why abandon Satoko when everything was looking brighter? Satoshi, you fucking idiot. That night, Keiichi worries about Satoko and what he can do. Earlier in the car, Irie also told him that if he tells the Child Consultation Center, Satoko might lie about being abused. And that was an act of atonement towards Satoshi, who had protected her before and then run away. So he puzzles through what to do in the event that the consultation center says wait and see again, culminating in a ridiculous plan to hide her in his house and sneak her scraps of food. Ultimately, he realizes that this will never work, and that taking care of another human being has so many considerations he hasn't even thought about, and so he finally falls asleep at about 3 a.m., dissatisfied. He wakes up at around 10 the next day, late for school. As he clumsily slips his shoes on, kind of stumbling out of the house, he's still thinking about Satoko. If I couldn't save her, and no one else could either, then we could only pray for a miracle. Are we so powerless? He decides to take a very roundabout route to school in order to give himself more time to think, and he ends up passing by the dam site. While there, someone calls out to him, and well, 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 if it isn't an Oh, you take pictures of birds? How lovely! Maybe those will get recognized post-mortem! Yep, it's Tomotake again. He seems a little lost, and Keiichi offers to take him to the shrine grounds. When they arrive, it turns out that another bad omen has been waiting for him. Oh. Is that you, my Barakun? Hello there. Are you off from school today? This time around, he's at least a little familiar with Takano, so we don't have to go through the whole song and dance again, do we? They're here to take pictures of the festival grounds, as the Watanagashi is tomorrow, and Tomatake is helping Takano learn photography. Speaking of the festival, the group ponders the freak deaths every year, and Keiichi realizes that half of the murder slash Onikikushi victims have had the last name Hojo. He brings this point up to Takano. It is true that if you look at those sacrificed in previous years, those named Hojo come up quite frequently, given how long it's gone on for. Her uncle being the one to die or disappear this year isn't out of the question. <laughs> she then asks him a strange question about who Santa Claus is. The dads of every family, of course. There are only humans in the world, after all. So then, by extension, Oyashiro-sama must also be- Daddy? I'm kidding, but he must also be the work of humans. She begins to go into more detail about the legends, but Tomatake cuts her off, claiming she's confusing him. This person loved walking through the profound forbidden abyss of risks and taboos. Ah, shucks, now I'm embarrassed. Oh, you were still talking about Takano, weren't you? Keiji asks just one more thing about who she thinks will be this year's victim. We all know what he's hoping for, of course. Well, I do have a few suspicions as to the kind of people who would probably become involved, of course. Who do you mean? If you found out, you might get into danger yourself, you know? Maybe the fifth year's curse would be you. <laughs> After prodding, she finally agrees to tell him something, but not who the victim will be. Rather, who she thinks is the one carrying out the curse. Please, tell me, who is putting this curse on people? Who is it? Who's deciding who gets cursed? And after I said that, I finally realized why I wanted to know. Okay, that's... ominous. Of course, we don't get to hear what she says, because we are conveniently whisked away to after Keiichi has finally made it to school. Apparently, Satoko is out today with a cold. Uh-huh. Sure thing. He's made it just in time for lunch, and the rest of the club members are trying their hardest to keep the mood light. It was at least clear, however, that I was the only one who had worried so much about rescuing her. At the very least, everyone else probably got the normal amount of sleep last night. Probably had good dreams, too. They definitely hadn't stayed up all night thinking so desperately. They were all worried when he was late that Keiichi had done something stupid, like try to kidnap Satoko, but of course, he thought that one through too much. 
He tells the club members about Satoko enduring the torture and that she might not want them to help her. They all agree, however, that after Keiichi saw how she was being treated, that they might have to try regardless of her wishes. Mion hesitates, but as a first step, they decide to go talk to Chie-sensei about what can be done. So Mion and Keiichi go to see her in the teacher's lounge. Clearly, she wants to talk about Satoko as well. They ask her that if the rumors about Satoko were true, what would she do about it? She discusses all the usual things a teacher has the power to do. Home visits, contacting the child consultation center. It's clear that she has her students' best interests at heart, but like Keiichi and the rest of the kids, she's pretty powerless. Although at Keiichi's goading, she does agree to do all the things she just mentioned, saying that she can definitely do something for Satoko. At this point, Keiichi is pretty angry. Something? Please stop saying such ambiguous things. Not something. We have to save her. If they end up deciding to wait and see again, how do you plan on taking responsibility? Just then the phone rings as Chie gets in contact with the principal and Mion has to drag Keiichi out of the room. The rest of the school day is not very fun. Chie sensei pops in occasionally, but the afternoon is mostly dedicated to self-study as she keeps having to run back into the office for phone conversations. All through the afternoon, her expression isn't helping Keiichi's anxiety. Feeling defeated, they all eventually go home, but on the way, Keiichi asks if he can stop by Mion's place as, once again, he has some manga to borrow. As in the last chapter, Mion's house is huge. So huge that they have to hire people on to maintain it. Keiichi insinuates that she should just be taking Satoko in if she's got all this money, but quickly apologizes. Just to be clear, my family may be rich, but it's not money that I can use freely for myself, okay? This is not actually what Keiichi came here to talk about, however, so he gets right to it. He says he'll give her the courtesy of not confirming if what he says is true, but that he needs a favor. She immediately understands what he's implying, and based on his conversation with Takano earlier and what we've heard from previous chapters, we can probably begin to guess as well. Mion says that there's no way she'll be able to grant his wish, but that she'll listen anyway. You know that stuff about Oyashiro-sama's curse, right? Even if each incident is solved, the string of deaths and accidents as a whole is still a mystery. But there's one thing connecting them all, and that's how the targets are always enemies of the village. Seems like it. The day after tomorrow. It's Watanagashi, isn't it? Has the sacrifice for this year's curse been decided already? If this year's curse isn't going to be Satoko's uncle, then... Please, change it to him. Keiichi claims that he doesn't care if she has anything to do with it, he just wants her to communicate with whoever does. But Keiichi, if she had that kind of power, wouldn't the chosen victim be Tepe already? Mion calls him out for calling her a murderer, and Keiichi begins to become more agitated. Come on, don't interrupt! Satoko's uncle, choose him for- Stop right there, Keichan. I want to start dinner soon, so I'd like to leave things at this. M Mion. It's like I said at the start, Oyashiro-sama's curse is just that. Even if there were people behind those incidents, they don't have anything to do with the Sonazaki family. Or me, either. If I really were, like you said, the one controlling the three families and choosing sacrifices every year, I'd probably grant your wish. But the reality is different. I'm just Mion Sonazaki. She asks him if Takano is the one who told him such silly things, and he denies it. You know, like a liar. They part ways after Mion brings him to the gate, and he feels a little guilty for asking her to do those things for him, for assuming she could. Later in the night, he lies awake again. Satoko, what was it like for her tonight? So, by this point, you might be starting to get a bit annoyed by the repetition. I don't think it ever gets so bad that it makes you hate the plotline, but for a while, the entire story is consumed by the one thought of helping Satoko and not being able to. One of the reasons for this is that this story is a visual novel, <coughs> repeating themselves and saying the same thing over and over is kind of something that they just do frequently. I have no idea why, maybe it just became so much of a stable for the medium that everyone just does it now. But there's another reason for this, one that we're going to see come into play very soon. Ryokishi is purposefully trying to drive you batty. 
Think as if you are Keiichi for a moment. One of your best friends, the girl whom you were supposed to protect, is in a horrible position, and try as you might, any angle you take, there's nothing you can do. It would be an all-consuming thought, at least for those of us with a healthy dose of anxiety in their lives. Over and over again, your mind runs through the same phrases, the same thoughts, hoping to find a path out. The definition of insanity. And Ryukishi is forcing these thoughts through your mind, forcing you to feel, like he so often does, just like Keiichi in this moment. You are going insane right along with him, and there's nothing you can do about it. Makes you feel pretty powerless, right? At first, everything is normal the next morning. Rena greets Keiichi, they meet up with Mion, and head to school. On the way, however, the conversation once again turns towards Satoko. Mion says she got in contact with her aunt, who's a welfare officer, and she told them that after Chie called in, it was decided that an officer would be visiting the house regularly from now on, but it seems like nothing else was done. They're given a little hope, however, as Satoko has come to school this morning. They ask her how it went with the probation officer, and she actually seems a little ticked off. It was a big bother for both me and my uncle. That person just barged in on us suddenly, jeez. When asked if anything else happened, however, that's a negatory. Both her uncle and her apologized for their misunderstandings, and that seems to be that, but Rika pulls Keiichi out into the hallway. Satoko said nothing was happening and chased them away. Satoko didn't ask for anyone's help. She didn't hide behind anyone. She was trying to ride out this pain. She wanted to show Satoshi proof that if he came back to them, she wouldn't need to hide behind him anymore. When pressing her about taking Satoko to safety even against her will, Chie-sensei approaches and tells him that once again, they determined that they should wait and see. According to Rika, the consultation center has actually been called three times now in regards to Satoko. The first one was made herself, and it was to spite her stepfather, the man who fell off the bridge in the second year. He was maybe a little too harsh on her, but after this incident realized his mistakes and tried to be better. And all along, he was never actually abusing her. At this point, because of her mother's tumultuous relationships with several men, Satoko had kind of turned into a little delinquent, so the Child Consultation Center has essentially blacklisted her. Keiji once again gets angry and tells Satoko off in his brain for trying to be so strong and not showing the consultation centers the signs of now genuine abuse occurring, but Rika tells him that for now, all they as her friends can do is watch over her. Maybe whatever help I offer will just go unwanted. Later, we experience the first fairly normal lunch in a long time. The gang's all here, they're making japes and jests. Even if the atmosphere is still somewhat heavy, they're still trying to make the best of it. Keiichi and Satoko get into a cat fight, as they're wont to do, and Keiichi thinks that Satoko is really kind of adorable, so he goes to pat her on the head. But all of a sudden, time freezes as something unexpected happens. I went to pet Satoko's head, and then she hit my hand? Satoko begins acting erratically, scratching at her head. Wondering if it was the head pat she didn't like, Keiichi of course goes to try again, and Satoko goes ballistic. She screams and throws Keiji off of her like he's a snake, and then she vomits. No one else really knows what to do. He approaches her to help, but the instant he gets near, she starts screaming and swats at him again. The other students have to essentially evacuate the classroom as Satoko throws shit around as if being attacked. Finally, she seems to calm down. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. In her bizarre hysterical state, Stoka even begins running into things and being scared by the loud noises it makes. Eventually, she just hugs the curtains and begs. Calm down, Satoko. Do you know who I am? Rena pushes him back in order to give Satoko more space, and she eventually just breaks down into sobbing. Nini! Nini! Help me! Help me! Unexpectedly, Rena kicks the cleaning supply closet over and goes to hug Satoko. This action might confuse you. It certainly confused me. Keiichi seems confused too. R Rena, what's wrong? Sorry, Keiichi-kun. 
Be quiet for a minute. What is it now? What happened? What did Satoko tell you? Shut the hell up! I told you to shut your mouth, asshole! Okay, something crazy is going on here. Everyone is acting crazy. Keiichi's losing his mind, Rena's shouting and now crying along with Satoko, and, well, Satoko herself, that goes without saying. Keiichi realizes then that they're too late to save Satoko. In less than a week, her uncle has already broken her. Whose fault was it? That went without saying. Mine. No, ours. In that sense, this was the inevitable result. I slumped down to my knees. Suddenly, Chie Sensei enters the room, and much to everyone's surprise, Satoko smiles and responds absolutely normally. There is no doubt, however, that behind the act, she's thoroughly broken, and now they've all seen it. Mion, at that moment, says the one thing that Keiichi doesn't want to hear. We... we can't do anything. But instead of freaking out like you'd expect Keiichi to do, something odd happens. My emotions all slipped away like they'd never been there, like a wave departing. Keiichi seems to transcend is how he puts it, or maybe he's just using I don't know. Regardless, his mind suddenly clears and everything makes perfect sense to him. He chastises himself for being stupid and not thinking of the one thing that could easily save her. No. Actually, I realized it yesterday. But as for the means, I would relied on some stupid curse from some dumb deity. I never considered carrying out the task myself. Keiichi? No. I would... Don't you dare. Obliterate Satoko's uncle. With only him gone, we'd go back to our normal lives. That was my supreme objective. My ultimate goal. Kill him. Definitely. If I wanted us to kill each other, it wouldn't even be minutes. I could do it in 1500 seconds. He was nothing. I could expel him from this world within just 1500 seconds of making up my mind. Oh my god, he's actually lost it this time. He's going to kill someone. But honestly, aren't you kind of relieved that this asshole is finally going to get what's coming to him? Even if you know it's wrong, aren't you just a little bit excited to watch Keiichi do it? Maybe you're crazy too. I'll obliterate him. I'll wipe him off the face of the earth. I will stomp out his very existence. Go away, disappear, and die! I'll tear your heart apart just like you did to Satoko. I'll have your blood as payment. Keiichi-kun? Are you alright? Keiichi comes back to himself only to find that he has fallen to the floor and everyone is looking at him strangely. You surprised us. You suddenly fell down. Were you having a nightmare? Shut it. Quit squeaking at me like that. Everyone backs away from him, but Keiichi quickly calms down. For a second, Keiichi-kun, your eyes were really scary. What? 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 Oh my god, we're in it now. We're fucking waist deep in it now, and there's no getting out. Of course, you're picking up on the implication that whatever has been happening to his friends in the previous chapters, whether demonic possession or otherwise, is now happening to him. You are Keiichi Maebara-kun, right? The gang goes to help set up the Watanagashi festival, but Keiichi goes home instead to plan a murder. Yep, this is what we're doing now. We're really doing this. You know, right when I start to think that Keiichi might be maturing as a character a little, I'm brutally reminded that we're stuck in a fucking time loop and there can be no character development for him in a way that really matters. So, in some small way, I'd like to think that Keiichi is learning from his mistakes even if he doesn't really remember. Shut up, you optimistic bitch! You just think you're playing a fun little game about Yandere's go to hell! I already understood this, but killing that man would be so very easy. The really hard thing would be not getting arrested for it, so we could get our peaceful days back. Foolhardiness would be needed to make the decision, but I needed to be calm, cool, colder than ice to put that plan together, kill him like a flame, but as systematic as ice. You know, Keiichi joining the cure was something I never imagined happening. 
Anyway, most of this chapter is just Keiji figuring out how he's gonna murder the douche canoe, starting with him asking his fucking mom about murder because she's really into mystery stories. Her advice to him is that the story doesn't get made if the body is never found, essentially. Keiji realizes, of course, that fucking no one is going to miss Tepe Hojo, so that part's easy. All he needs to do is cover it up enough that no one stumbles upon the crime. First, he heads back to school in order to pick up his murder weapon. I'm sure I don't even need to say what it is. I don't need to explain how terrifying a metal baseball bat can be as a weapon. Of course, his bat of choice is Satoshi's. Satoshi, I'll give you one last chance to save your sister. You're a coward, but I will stand in for you. There is no more suitable weapon in the world for putting that man to death than your bat. He hides the bat behind a car for easy access tomorrow and takes off on his bike. Next, he goes to the swamp to see if it will be the ideal location to dump the body. He ultimately decides against it, but keeps it in mind for the weapon and maybe Tepe's motorcycle. Then he scopes out the woods for a good spot to ambush him and decides to call him tomorrow when Satoko's out of the house, claiming to be the police department. Finally, he heads back home, giving Mion a call in order to get her to agree to take Satoko to the Watanagashi festival. She is a little inebriated, probably at a drinking party post Watanagashi setup, so this should be pretty easy. Satoko, she's in a pretty bad spot. I hope she's okay. She can't be okay. You saw too, didn't you? What she was like? We failed her all this time, and now she's become like that. All I did was watch, after all. So, well, at least... Couldn't we at least let her have fun for one night? Keiichi, you smooth motherfucker. After asking her to take Satoko, Mion asks him why he doesn't just do it himself. He says he's got something to do. Hey, Mion, could I leave Satoko to you? Just for tomorrow night? onto someone like me. It's just for tomorrow night. That was a lie! Saying it's just for the night of Watanagashi! And then it was... forever. Liar. <laughs> but I guess... we're even, huh? I couldn't... couldn't keep the promise I made with you. I left her alone. Alone. All this time. Keiichi's confused, but I get the distinct feeling that she's really talking to Satoshi here. Keiichi says her name, which seems to clear her out of her haze. Mion explains that last year she received a near identical phone call from Satoshi, asking her to take Satoko to the Watanagashi just for tomorrow night. Let's give Keiichi a second to catch up. Why would Satoshi make the exact same call? If, in the truest sense, he really made the exact same phone call as I am right now. And the incident where their aunt was beaten to death, that's... So Keiichi conjectures, as you probably have for a while now, that Satoshi was the true culprit in the murder of his aunt, and the reason he disappeared most likely wasn't because he ran away, it was because he was going to get caught. And he decided not to make Satoko the sister of a murderer. Mion agrees to take Satoko to the Watanagashi and hangs up the phone, leaving Keiichi to question everything he thought he knew about Satoshi. We thought that he ran away to Tokyo, but according to Mion, the day he withdrew his savings, the bear in the window that he was going to buy for Satoko was gone. So where did Satoshi go? And what does this mean for Keiichi, who's about to follow in his footsteps? All right, kids, it's time. Hey, kids, want to see a dead body? It's the day of the festival, and also the day that Keiichi kills Tepe. God, I still can't believe we're doing this. First, however, Keiichi has to dig a hole. He grabs the shovel from his house, but struggles a little to dismantle it. I knew why. It wasn't because I was nervous. My weak-willed self, deep within me, was hesitant. I knew that the act of dismantling this shovel was the first step I'd take to becoming a murderer. Keiji has planned this goddamn thing out so meticulously that he even takes the long route around Satoko's house so that no one will see him there the day of the murder. Once he gets into the woods, Keiji really struggles to build up the courage to start digging. God, if you're having trouble digging a hole, I don't know what to tell you about your prospects, buddy. But he does it, even if it takes a lot more work than he anticipated. It was hot. It was disgusting. 
I was sticky. I was itchy. All those uncomfortable feelings surged through me in waves. Damn it all. So what? Are you telling me to pack up and go home? Hey. Hey, dude. Who are you talking to? Yourself? Okay. I was just making sure. While he's digging this hole and lamenting his lack of physical ability, Keiji thinks back to elementary school when that kind of thing seems so important, and wait a second, I think this is the first time we're really getting any info about Keiji's past. Apparently, Keiji's mother saw him down in the dumps about not being as physically strong as other kids, and maybe in an effort to give him something to be proud of, she suggested that he go to cram school. For those less weebish among us, cram school is extra school that some Japanese youth attend after regular school in order to study to get into college, aka more school, because college is actually, like, somewhat difficult to get into there. Anyway, at first Keiji's really digging how smart he feels and how much people praise him for how smart he is. Eventually, however, Keiji got too big of a head about it and became a bit of a pompous ass, meaning he didn't really have a lot of friends. However, he still excelled academically and still got praise for it round and round like the wheels of a bicycle. I thought moving forward like that was how life worked. Like a bicycle. When I moved to Hinamizawa, I realized how inadequate it was. The reason he gives us for the move is that some things happened and the family wanted a change in scenery, but, but we quickly move on to reminiscing about his first day at school and meeting the gang. From the first moment he opened the door, he got pranked by Satoko, leaving him thoroughly surprised. This fresh sense of surprise had never left my life, even to this day. Every day was a fresh new surprise. I'd never had a single boring day since coming here. <laughs> you sure haven't. When did those sunny days all go wrong? What mistake was made? Keiji, isn't that why you chose your own path? To take back that life? This wasn't a path I could see very far down. Not like the road parents or society could offer. Don't be ashamed at breaking from the brightly lit paved road. In fact, feel proud that you found your own path to walk. Yeah, the path of fucking murder. Finally, just as it's getting dark, the hole is deep enough, and Keiichi is getting ready to do the last tiny bit of prep, grabbing the bat and calling Tepe out to meet him. He's still hesitating a bit, though, as it's getting close to that time, but he comforts himself by saying that it's good he's a little scared of taking a life. Because I was human. It was so funny to me that I'd be the bearer of Yashirosama's curse at the same time I was aware I was human. It would all be over very soon. Everything would end. Yes. When the Higarashi cried. Oh shit, he said it! He said the thing, oh fuck! Anyway, he goes to the school to grab his bat, and though worried that someone might have found and moved it, it's there waiting for him. Sorry for the wait, Satoshi. It's been a long time coming. You prepared for this? Unfortunately, he hits a snag in his plans. He can't call from home because he wouldn't make it to the planned ambush point in time, but he can't call from the school because the door's fucking locked. He berates himself for not thinking this part of the plan through, but suddenly, a miracle occurs. One of the forestry guys they share the building with rides up on a bike and unlocks the door. Keiji follows behind him, sneaks into the teacher's lounge, and calls Satoko's house. Hello? This is the Shishibone Okonomiya police station. We currently have your daughter, Satoko Hojo, here with us. What? Satoko? What did that brat do? Hook, line, and sinker. Keiji nearly panics because for a minute, Tepe doesn't remember where the police station is, but neither does Keiji. He's saved once more, though, because Tepe then remembers on his own. Keiji takes off towards the woods, ready in wait to smack the bitch. He hides in the bushes, freaking out a little about the specifics of what he's going to do with classic Keiji anxiety, but suddenly, the Higarashi stops singing. It's quickly replaced by the sound of a motorbike coming up the road. The motorcycle appeared. Was it really him? Was it really Satoko's uncle? I looked at its characteristics again. Its color, shape, and most of all, the man's clothes and face. Satoko. Now, your nini will end it, okay? Closer. Closer. The bike came closer. Let's go, Satoshi. Yeah. Keiji tackles Tepe off the bike and almost panics. But then he calms down, that odd feeling entering his body again. The more I walked, the more I felt my body cooling, calming. 
chilling with frost. Yes, at this moment, this guy had lost permission to live. Entirely calmly, Keiji delivers his first strike directly to his head. Keiji hits him over and over everywhere and anywhere Tepe doesn't block with his arms. Finally, the older man is able to get up and try to flee, but Keiji is faster and chases him down. Even as Tepe is running, Keiji is still bashing him with his bat. It's easy. He was lowly, vulgar, a diminutive animal. Such a puny little creature had harmed Satoko. Now run. Run, 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 then fall and moan and die. Also, as a side note, entirely ruining the tone, I know, but holy shit, the writing in this chapter is just fantastic. Ryukishi and the translators over here just flopping their massive stiffies on the table. Regardless. You were the obstacle, the mistake, the heresy in that world, but I would correct that mistake now. Tonight was the Watanagashi Festival. The Holy Night, where taking just one life was permitted in the name of Oyashiro-sama's curse. <sighs> it looked like the Higarashi stopped crying at some point. When the Higarashi cried, everything would end. Ah, oh, shit! <laughs> yeah, so Keiichi bashes his bat into Tepe's skull, and now he is very dead. And... Listen, you might have noticed my slight glee throughout this section, but you can't tell me that you didn't feel it too. Yeah, Keiji is taking the life of a human being, but Tepe Hojo was a worthless piece of shit human being who didn't deserve to live, so it's fine, right? We'll see how that pans out in a bit, and even now you might still be feeling a mixture of things at this visceral description. And then I swung my bat far above and brought it down. His body leaped like a bow but he didn't try and cover his head. After spending a few moments making his head an emoji, the hits gradually started to feel different, and it started to spray a filthy dark red liquid everywhere. Yikes. So now it's raining, which is ultimately a good thing as it'll wash away some of the evidence, though filling in that pit might be a little more difficult. It looks like he might not even get there, however, as upon looking around, he realizes that they are now an incredible distance away from Satoko's house, actually along the road that leads to Okinomiya. Hmm, this ringing any alarm bells for anyone? It will soon. Keiichi is relieved the deed is done, but now the work begins. He doesn't only want to commit murder, remember, he wants to get away with it. First, he drives the motorbike to Onikafuchi Swamp, said to be bottomless, remember, and dumps it in, then wonders about the bat. Before he does anything with it, though, he, uh, starts to talk to it. Like it's actually Satoshi. Satoshi, I probably, well, misunderstood you. Satoshi listened quietly, without nodding. Uh, great. He's lost it. For real, this time. He says a small speech to the bat about how grateful he is for the help and how they both work to protect Satoko, and then he flings the bat into the swamp. Now he has to deal with everything else. Keiichi doesn't know if he's gonna make it, as he's starting to black out at times, and also it's so dark that he's never going to be able to find the shovel he left in the dark. A brutal miscalculation. He ultimately decides to go back home, get a second shovel and a lantern, but he is worried about leaving evidence behind. As he makes it home, he realizes the distance he's now put between himself and his happy life. This isn't what he wanted. He's starting to regret his actions a little, but he still has to finish the job. And besides... I successfully... saved Satoko. I did. <laughs> That's right, I... I did something good, didn't I? He cries for a second, from relief and from guilt, but Jesus Christ, man, save that for later. You're giving me anxiety. Knowing your luck, fucking Oishi or somebody's gonna stumble upon the fucking corpse while you're crying your eyes out. Keiichi finds the corpse again and digs a new hole right next to it. Finally, when the hole is deep enough, he shoves the body in and collapses. This time, for real, it was over. I did it. I did it. I did it, you motherfucker. Eventually, he gets up and starts biking home, but it's raining and he's exhausted, and he has to carry the shovel in one hand, so when a car honks for him to get out of the middle of the road, he doesn't. Instead, he just falls over and twists his ankle. The driver pulls up besides him, and he's sure that he's toast. Oh. Oh my. <laughs> Look who it is. We know that voice. T-Takano-san. 
Good evening. The moon is very pretty tonight, my Barakun. Out of all the people I could have met, I got the sudden feeling that this was the one I wanted to see the least. She, of course, questions his shovel, and Keiichi claims that he and Rena left it behind on a treasure hunt. She calls him out on his lies, but doesn't seem like she's going to call the police or anything. I wonder why. He considers briefly killing Takano. That's a scary look. Did I tease you too much? <laughs> she asks if Keiichi will kindly get out of the way, but as it turns out, the ankle he twisted is now certainly sprained, and he's so tired that he can't even get up, so Takano offers to take him home. She asks if he can pick up his bike the next day, but it's got the name My Bara on it, so he can't leave it. The trunk is already full. If I put it in the back seat, it'll get the seats dirty with mud. Well, given how you're already in here, it's already dirty, I suppose. I'll be really nice, but just for tonight, okay? <laughs> the mean jokes were one thing, but couldn't she do something about that eerie smile of hers? They drive off towards Keiji's house. Takano tries to say something, but Keiji doesn't catch it, so she asks again. The body. How well was it buried? What? What are you talking about? When burying bodies in mountains like these, you have to bury it fairly deep, because wild dogs will often smell the corpse and dig it out. Keiji thinks again that he has to kill her, but he hesitates because she's driving, and then she makes a witty comment which makes him think that she might have been joking. They make it to his house, and upon unloading his bike from the back, Keiji sees that his is not the only one back there. Alright, I will be leaving then. Keep it a secret that we had a nice evening drive together by ourselves, okay? <laughs> Especially from Jiro-san. Jiro Tomatake, of course. The man who was supposed to die tonight. Thinking about him, of course, leads Keiji to remember when he ran into him the other day, and he realizes something. The bike in the back of Takano's car. It's Tomatake's. He asks her about it, but she says that it can't be his bike. That would be strange, wouldn't it? It would mean Jiro-san was in Hinamizawa. Without a bike. I'd have to have left Jiro-san somewhere and put his bike in the car, wouldn't I? It wouldn't make sense. So, uh... Yeah, this gives us a whole other can of worms to open. First of all, along with Tomatake, Takano is supposed to die tonight. So why is she here helping Keiichi? And second, why was she driving along the road where Tomatake might have died with his bike in the back of her car? Okay, well, that second one's pretty obvious, but there's still the question of why she would kill Tomatake. Does she do this in every chapter? And if she does, who burns her to death immediately afterwards, a whole prefecture away? Honestly, Takano is, to me, right now, the most confusing element of this story. Takano bids Keiji farewell after telling him that they never saw each other tonight, and Keiji realizes a second behind us that she doesn't want to be seen for exactly the same reason as him. The demons were never supposed to meet, but suddenly, they did. There was no reason for them to fight. Both their objectives had already been accomplished. The female demon, her mouth twisted into a distorted, fearless smile. It was already too late to kill her. He laments that he missed his chance to kill her, and wishes for something that is very hard to take back. It was a command. Die. Die. And keep your mouth shut for eternity. So, Cage is gone to a pretty bad place this chapter. Yeesh! As Keiji walks inside, he can't help but notice something strange. A footstep. One that's not his, but seems to be creeping right behind him. But Keiji just says, nope, can't deal with that tonight, and heads to bed. Frankly, after everything we've just seen, I'm terrified. I have no idea where the story's going from here. I guess we just have to keep reading and, and hope that the train wreck isn't too bad, because if Keiichi just got away with murder, well, there wouldn't be a story in the first place, right? When Keiichi wakes up the next morning, his first thought is that it was all a dream. He goes over everything that happened yesterday, and laments the fact once again that he ran into Takano. Still, the more I think about Takano-san's eyes, Takano-san, 
She knew that I'd killed someone. I should have killed her. But he shakes off his trepidation. He's done it. He accomplished his goal, and now he can reap the rewards, right? His peaceful life with his friends has returned. It's very late. It's almost lunchtime, but he heads off to school with a spring in his step. With any luck, by this point, Satoko has shared the news that her uncle didn't come home last night. But as Keiji is about to step into the schoolyard, he stops. So there was an extra footstep. That's right. Just like in the first chapter, Keiji has attracted the attention of... something, it seems. Something insisted on stepping when he steps, and following close behind. There was really only one thing it could have meant. Last night still wasn't over. It was still going. Still. With a new sense of trepidation, Keiji heads into the schoolhouse to find that all of his friends are there. Yes, even Satoko. He walks into the classroom and tries to be cheery, and all his friends back him up. Maybe you haven't gotten out of the festive mood yet, huh? Hey now, festive mood? I wasn't... Keiji, did you make sure to watch my dance? Wait a second. They're talking almost like... Yep, he saw it just fine. Didn't you see how big an applause he gave you? And he ignored it when that blockhead Shion came up and made a pass at him. Like he went to the Watanagashi after all. Yesterday, during the Watanagashi festival, Keiji Maebara had appeared. As I threw away my humanity, turned into a demon, and was busy beating Satoko's uncle to death, I was having a great time at the festival last night. Hold on. Haven't we seen something like this before? Two of the same person appearing at once? It happened in the last chapter. Twice, actually. Mion was dead in the well when she stabbed Keiichi, and Takana was busy being burned to death while guiding Keiichi and Shion through the storehouse. And now it's happening again. What the hell? It's starting to feel like Keiichi has fallen into some sort of alternate reality. He looks for himself amongst his classmates, making sure that this fake Keiji Maebara didn't come to school on time, and he's the imposter. But he only sees himself. Chie essentially calls for afternoon classes, though, so there's no more discussion of the Watanagashi. Isn't this supposed to be the day that everything goes back to normal? So why does it feel so weird? During class, Keiji asks Rena to recount the events of the previous night, claiming that he had some beers and doesn't remember some of it. Everything is the same as how it really happened, until apparently Rena and the others met up with Rika and Keiichi at the festival. When the teachers got her back turned, he then goes and questions Rika, who says that they met up near the ritual storehouse, but in this chapter, Keiichi doesn't even know what that is. He's getting very confused and agitated now, and that's when his eyes fall upon Satoko. She still looks pretty miserable. Of course, she wouldn't know that her uncle's dead yet, but soon she'll feel better. And honestly, it's pretty convenient if there was a Keiji Maebara at the festival because it gives him an alibi. So he decides to just try to forget about that whole day and go on with his life. At the end of school, Keiji tries to cheer himself and Satoko up by hosting a club meeting. Of course, Satoko tries to get away, but Keiji pushes her. We're friends. That means we can spend time with each other. I mean, you had a great time at the festival yesterday with everyone, didn't you? When exactly? was like playing and having fun at the festival. The only one having fun was you, Keiji-san. With a sinking heart, Keiji realizes that Satoko didn't go to the festival after all. The others explain that they dragged her out there, but she went home as soon as she got to the shrine. I'm so glad you enjoyed yourself at the festival. I'm so glad you had enough fun for me too. I mean, I want to participate in the club too. But right now, I, I can't. I can't! Keiji wants to tell her so badly that it's over now, that she can relax, so he says something that he probably shouldn't. He didn't come home last night, did he? Your uncle? What are you talking about, Keiji-san? When has he not been there? When? When? E even yesterday, he was torturing me so much! He yelled at me, he shouted at me! He found fault with everything I did! He threw the dinner I made at him on the floor! It was hot! It was messy! And I cleaned all of it up! I cleaned all of it! And this morning, when he woke me up to make him breakfast, he got so mad at me! Wait. This morning? 
Keiichi doesn't have the opportunity to ask her about it because she runs out of the room crying. Also, can I say, holy shit, this man can write, dear god! That made me feel things! But before Keiji can even process what just happened, Nguyen begins to speak. She asks him what he meant by asking if Satoko's uncle had come home last night. Suddenly, the world begins to warp. Rena and Mion are becoming uncanny again, and nothing makes sense. Okay, chan is it somehow inconvenient for you for Satoko's uncle to be around? Satoko's uncle is an awful person, no doubt. I think we'd all be better off with him gone just as much as you do. But he's here. There's nothing we can do, right? They're mocking him. That much is clear. They're trying to get him to confess what he did. Keiichi knows something is wrong now. His friends would never say things like this. And he killed Tepe Hojo. He knows that he has. Rena and Mion say that they're going treasure hunting, and they force Keiichi to go along with them. They all split up to get changed, but Keiichi tells Rena finally that he's got something to do. I might have a cold, so I wanted to go get it checked out and get some medicine. I mean, his head hurts, so it's not a lie. Not really. If you're going to the clinic... Then you should go soon. Thanks. I'll do that. Make sure you go, okay? Go. For real. I will. He tries to make a dumb joke, saying that he'll bring the bill tomorrow, but Rena seriously responds that he should. Keiichi is kind of freaking out at this point, and understandably so. If I'm honest, I'm kind of freaking out. I did what I did because I wanted my peaceful life back. But what? What on earth was all this? Something had gone mad, leaving the world out of order. With the other KG Mayabara, with those creepy footsteps I've been hearing, with Rena and Mion acting so curious, and above all, with him being alive. Where was I? At this point, I'm starting to think that he's in some other dimension, or in hell, or purgatory. Don't worry, the solution isn't that obvious, but it sure seems like it at this point, doesn't it? Before he goes to the clinic, Keiji goes back to school to check Satoshi's locker. If the bat's still there, then he has to admit that all of last night was some sort of delusion. Lucky for him, flinging open the locker reveals that it's still gone, still at the bottom of Onigafuchi's swamp. He makes it to the hospital, wondering what he should tell the doc when he gets in to see him. He's there for a cold, but he really wants someone to tell him that he's not insane. When he gets into the examination room, he's met with a big surprise. Irie is the doctor. I mean... Come on, Keiji, you've literally seen someone call him Doc before. Then again, this is actually a weird translation thing, as doctors are called sensei in Japan. But, so are teachers. And mangakas. In English, there really isn't an equivalent prefix that equates to someone highly respected for the job they do, except maybe sir, but that would be a weird way to refer to a doctor. I think the translators did the best they could, and Keiji comes off as a bit of a knobhead, which he already was anyway, so it's fine. Irie makes a dumb, morbid joke as always, and that calms Keiichi down a little. If Coach is talking about his maid fetish, then there's still some sanity in the world. Keiji asks Irie if he saw him at the festival, but Irie was in the drinking tent most of the night, so didn't. That was a strange question. Did you have too much to drink and forget about what happened last night? An underage, too. You bad child. Coach was okay. He was the coach from the world I knew. He wasn't someone from this abnormal world. Keiji feels calmer and asks Irie if it's possible that he has a twin. Coach laughs it off and tells Keiji about the legends of doppelgangers, copies of yourself that you see only right before you die. But it's not a threat, just a story. Finally, Keiji feels calm enough to tell someone the truth, so he tells Irie that he wasn't at the festival last night, but that everyone says he was. You're certain you were doing something else? I know I'm being awfully rude, but are you sure you're not mistaken? I know I'm not. My memories are clear as day, and, and they were real. During the festival, you weren't at the shrine, and you were doing something somewhere else. Can you definitely prove that? This gives Keiichi a good idea. If he digs back up the corpse, then that proves that he's not insane, right? And that Tepe is really dead. Irie notices just how agitated he is. Why don't I give you a sedative that'll let you sleep for a bit? That way... I'm not being strange! I apologize if I've offended you, so please, calm down. 
I definitely didn't go to the festival. That's the truth. Irie says that he believes him, but Keiji sees him writing notes in German so that Keiji won't be able to read them. He decides that the only way to get him to really believe him is to tell the truth. Fucking dumbass. It would have been impossible for me to be at the festival because I was killing Satoko's uncle at the time. You killed Satoko-chan's uncle? Why would you... No, that was a foolish question. I believed it was the most direct method of saving Satoko, so I carried it out. I don't have any regrets. Keiichi tells him the whole series of unfortunate events. Irie doesn't believe him and tries to pick apart his story, but of course there are no holes. Keiichi planned this meticulously, and it really happened. Do you feel guilty at all? I don't. I did it so that I could return the peaceful days that he's stolen from us. Irie states that he can't make any statements condoning murder, but he does place a hand on Keiichi's shoulder. For saving Satoko-chan, I thank you. But then Keiichi tells him that it seems like he somehow came home last night, and Irie has him reenact the event so he can judge if he's really dead. Considering that Keiichi cracked his fucking skull open and kept hitting him for several minutes after, Irie concurs with my assessment that he's, like, super dead. Yet still, Satoko says he came home. Irie brings up the idea that maybe the man Keiichi killed wasn't Tepe Hojo at all, but when describing the man in detail, all of the characteristics match up. But there's one more thing. Tepe Hojo has a tattoo. If the body has that tattoo, then Keiichi's in the clear. It's very bizarre, though. Keiichi was apparently in two places at once, and now it seems Satoko's uncle was too. Irie seems to realize this is going to be a long night and goes to put on some tea and let the other employees go home. Finally, Keiichi is given a minute to calm down and think things through, especially with someone believing him, and he realizes that he's got to drop a fat piss. I said it like that specifically because what Keiji actually says is, I suddenly realized I really had to urinate. And I want to call him a pussy again. Pussy. Keiji happens to hear Irie talking to an associate and listens in. He tells one of the other men to make some black tea. Mix in Emma Barbadol or Ravenol. Cover the taste with milk and sugar. Uh-oh. Maybe Irie isn't as much on Keiji's side as he thought. He also asks how many male staff and how many mountain dogs are present. I thought... I thought he was the one person in Hinamizawa who would understand. This, this was, no, this was. There are signs of fabrications or falsehoods that his memories of yesterday in particular are completely confused. He can no longer tell truth from falsehood, but as for how quickly this mental disorder emerged, it's just not normal. In any case, I want him to take a quiet nap. I believed you. I, I believed you. I had let down my guard because I thought you were the only ally I had after that insane night. Was that a lie? But before Keiji can do much of anything, he sees a nurse approach Irie. She tells him that they found Takano, dead in the mountains. Of course, as always. Hey, wait. So then, does that mean when I cursed her, wishing for her death, that wish was Granted? <laughs> Serves you right. Serves you right. I wish for her to die, so she did. If this wasn't just a coincidence, and she died because I wished for it, then you'll die next, coach. You betrayed me. Conveniently, Yurie gets a call from none other than Oishi, the police officer, right at that moment, and so Keiji runs into the room, jumps out the window, and hops on his bike. At this point in time, you might be realizing something. Keiji is actually going insane this time. I'm gonna be blunt, because while there's clearly some weird fucking shit going on that isn't explained, Keiji is not acting like himself anymore. I mean, for God's sake, he just got done cursing a doctor and cackling menacingly under his breath. Each of these three chapters has had a different emotion that the writer is using Keiji to thrust upon you. For the first chapter, it was fear. Fear of the people around him and fear for our protagonist's life. In the second was sadness for a tragedy that could have been so easily prevented. But this is the first chapter that demands you take yourself out of Keiji's mindset. This is the one that says, 
no, something isn't right about this, and something is not right about Keiichi. This chapter is supposed to communicate confusion. There is so much going on at once. Murders, doppelgangers, demons, and at the core of it all, the very real threat of abuse. But at this point, that core has gotten lost in the chaos. It's not about Satoko anymore. How much of what we're experiencing through our very limited scope is real, how much is imagined, and how much is misunderstood? Spoiler for you. I've finished playing through all of Higurashi, I actually don't think some of you know that for whatever reason, and this chapter still kind of confuses me. It's the first major hint you get to take a step back and figure out what's really important. That's why I like to do these little step backs every episode, and will continue to do so. Anyway, have we taken a breath? Feeling calmer now? Good. Then let's go watch Keiichi dig up a dead body. I'm not the crazy one! Hinamizawa is! How... How dare you treat me like a madman? Die. Die. Just fucking die already! He laments the fact that instead of ending up in a happy, cheerful world like he wanted, he seems to have found himself in a nightmare. Why did I end up... It's such a strange, ghastly world. I don't want it. I don't want this strange world. When did it go wrong? When? When? He decides that the only thing he can do is make sure that this punishment was all worth it. He has to go check the body. He stumbles around in the growing darkness, and eventually finds the spot where he buried the body. Keiichi is freaking out all this time, thinking that someone is watching him, most likely the person taking fandom steps right behind him, but it actually turns out that he was right. Good evening. <laughs> the moon sure is beautiful tonight. Not only Oishi, but a group of police officers. Please, don't mind us. Just think of us as... Trees in the forest, perhaps. Yes, pay no attention to us. Please, continue digging your hole. He's got him surrounded. Keiichi can't get away. The only thing left to do is to keep digging his hole. Might as well be his grave. That corpse is going to appear eventually, Tepe Hojo or not. Keiichi pauses his digging, wondering if it was Takano who told the police about this spot, but Oishi kicks him in the back. Hurry up and dig, please. You really should consider the fact that some of us are standing out here in the rain. Fuck you. Oishi continues to belittle and make fun of Keiichi the whole time he's digging, and like, holy shit. I feel like we're finally getting the side of Oishi that everyone else is talking about when they say he sucks. Like, maybe it's because we can only see from the perspective of a literal murderer, but Oishi can be really scary when he wants to be. Oishi gets impatient with Keiichi and has the other police officers climb into the hole to dig. While Oishi is splashing buckets of muddy water on his face, Keiichi decides to curse him, too. If I have some strange power to kill someone by cursing them, like with Takano-san, I'll curse you and kill you. What a rebellious look you're wearing. Why don't we use this opportunity to teach you a thing or two in that regard? But before he can do anything, the other police call him over. Even though Cage is about ready to confess to what he did, there's nothing there. The hole is empty. Thoroughly empty, except for an old drain pipe. All Oishi does is laugh. <laughs> well, well, I'm at a loss. Aren't you, my Barasan? He grabs Keiji by the collar and drags him over to the hole. And it's true. There's no corpse. I get it. I get it. Dead people don't like to play by the rules here in Hinamizawa. Then I'll kill you as many times as I need to. I'll keep killing you until you never show your face to Satoko again. As Keiji vows this to himself, the police take off, leaving Keiji soaked in the rain next to the empty hole where Tepe Hojo's body should be. Just like Satoko had said, I'd failed to kill her uncle. In order to free Satoko, I became a demon, and this abnormal world was my reward. Yes, metaphorically, I had fallen into the demon world. Honestly, I'm starting to think that that's not such a metaphor. Keiji vows to kill him over and over again if he needs to. It's the next morning, and as he gets dressed, Keiji realizes something we did a long time ago. That he's not been doing this for Satoko. He hasn't even thought about her while undertaking the act. He's become just a no-good demon. 
he wonders if the same thing happened to Satoshi. Since he has ultimately met the same fate, it would stand to reason that Satoshi would be somewhere here in this hell world. And then he hears the second pair of steps again. Are... could you... be Satoshi? With what he thinks must be Satoshi behind him, Keiichi sneaks out of the house to free Satoko once and for all. His destination? Her house. He goes for a hatchet as his weapon of choice this time. Hey, Paul! Centering himself, Keiichi remembers why he's doing this, what really matters, his friends, and the fun times they spent together. I didn't believe that people should ever think murder was okay. But still, the times I'd had were enjoyable enough for me to commit such a crime. After daydreaming about the fun times he so desperately wants to come back, Keiichi makes it to the Hojo residence. The motorbike is absent from the front, which is either because Keiichi threw it into the swamp or he's just absent at the moment. There's only one way to really find out. Hefting the hatchet, Keiji enters the house and immediately is hit by an awful smell. There was food scattered about the table, giving an impression decidedly different from a happy family's mealtime. By the way, I really like the contrast here between the beginning of the episode with the wholesome dinner scenes and this image of gross, rotting food in front of a television at the end. It really does a nice job to hammer home how different the story has become. Oh, sorry Keiji, I interrupted. No sign of anyone either. But with the television on, he must have been close. Could he have anticipated my coming and be hiding? Waiting for me? Dude, if he's not dead, then clearly the man doesn't even know you exist. Keiji goes slowly from room to room, but all of them are empty. After examining the food and realizing it must be last night's dinner, Keiji hears a strange bumping noise coming from the bathroom. It must be the water boiler, so clearly someone's in the tub, but there's something wrong about this. I'm not the only one who thinks that, right? People didn't normally take a bath this early in the morning. If one did, then it would mean that in this house, time had been stopped ever since some moment last night. Satoko's uniform covered in stains is in a laundry basket, so clearly she's the one in the bath past all the steam. Uh-oh. I've got a bad feeling about this. Could she... She couldn't have possibly been in there since last night. That would be impossible. All he can do is pull open the door and see. And, hey... Can I just say that I'm happy that this visual novel has some class? At least we get a tasteful black screen so we don't see a literal child naked, and later when she wears a towel, she's pretty covered up. Well, unless you're playing with the OG sprites. What the fuck? Anyway, of course Satoko is roasting to death in the bath. He drags her from the bathtub and wraps her in a towel before opening the vent to let cool air into the room. This enables Satoko to slowly regain consciousness. She tries to mutter something, but it's unintelligible. This is clearly heat stroke. Keiichi gets a towel soaked in cold water and drapes it on her forehead, but there's not much else he can do for her. Finally, Satoko's mumbling becomes a little more understandable. I... <coughs> Boy. <coughs> Keiichi realizes that she's counting. According to him, people tell little kids in the bath to count to a hundred, don't look at me, must be a Japanese thing, but Satoko is up to 5,000. Holy fuck, she has been boiling all night. How... how long were you supposed to count in your own bathtub? Um, uh, I... uncle... It seems as if her uncle told her to count to 10,000 in the bathtub. This sends Keiichi into a boiling rage, making a scream that rattles the heavens, a scream that I will not inflict upon Dragon because I think he'd cry. Regardless, Keiji is filled with rage. He runs through the house, destroying things with his hatchet. Upon finding her uncle's room, he demolishes it. Anyway, her uncle wasn't in the house right now. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. I know the line isn't supposed to be read like that, but it's just written so matter-of-factly that it makes me giggle. Keiji finally remembers that he left Satoko on the fucking ground and runs to take her to the clinic. She thanks him, seeming a little more together now. Keiji proceeds to carry her up the hill to the clinic, also still carrying his hatchet, because he's a... Dumbass, but as he approaches the clinic, he notices something. Red, flashing lights. It turns out, they're from police cars. Keiji places Satoko in a thicket to hide her. What's going on? I don't know. I'll go see what happened, so you stay here for a moment. Even a lady in a place like this wearing nothing but a bath towel simply unforgivable. If you can still fire off those insults, you'll be fine. Uh, even in the most dire of scenarios, there's always time to make a stupid joke. Never change, Higurashi. As he approaches, Keiichi overhears a police officer questioning a doctor, but the doctor in question is not Irie. 
Apparently, this doctor found someone who had OD'd on sleeping pills, and though the doctor tried to save them, they died shortly after being found. A minute later, and Keiichi confirms that the victim was, in fact, Dr. Irie. Coach killed himself. Why would he do that? There couldn't have been any reason he wanted to die. The only reason that came to mind was that I wanted him dead. As he continues to listen, he also hears that they're searching for Oishi's car, so he's at least missing, too. Keiichi is now convinced that he has the power to make people die. He's beginning to get really freaked out when Satoko comes up behind him and asks him what in the hell is going on. She's clearly still unstable, but at least she's back on her feet. Like a callous idiot, Keiichi just drops it on her that Irie kill himself, and Satoko breaks down crying. I got so angry that he treated me like a madman yesterday. That he'd betrayed me. That I thought he'd be better off dead. But even Coach, who to me deserved to die, still must have had people who loved and respected him. In all his efforts to save her, Keiichi has broken his promise to Irie. He's made Satoko cry. Satoko seems to recover and tells him that she's heading to Rika's house to get some clothes before going back to the clinic. She's really wobbly though, so it doesn't look like she's recovered as much as she's trying to let on. But Keiichi's still reeling from the deaths that he thinks he caused. In a moment of weakness, he confesses to Satoko that he wished for Takano, Irie, and Oishi to die, and that they did. Then, he mentions Tepe. Keiichi, you whore. Don't do this. He was there yesterday, right? At your house? Could we please stop talking about him? I don't want to. It's impossible. Y he couldn't have been there. That man couldn't have been there after the night of Watanagashi because... Because I... No! No more, please! No more about that man! I killed him! With my own hands! You probably think I've gone a little crazy, don't you? I don't blame you. I can't... I can't believe it myself. Satoko tells him that he should probably go home and rest, clearly afraid of him, but she stumbles trying to get up the shrine steps. Keiichi goes to catch her, but she flinches away from him. Yeah, hate to say it, this was probably not the best time to drop all this stuff on her. Don't be naive, Keiichi Maibara. You didn't do it so that Satoko would thank you. You did it so Satoko would be happy. And that was what led to this ending. Keiichi continues to follow Satoko, even though she's ignoring him now, and they pass by the shrine donation box, which for some reason has an awful lot of crows perched around it. Keiichi thinks it's terrible for someone to leave garbage in the box, but then something horrible crosses his mind. Whoa, what was, was this? It's not a garbage bag in the donation box. It's a body. Rika's body. Satoko wails, and Keiichi vomits as he sees that Rika's stomach has been cut open vertically, her guts ripped forcefully out and left to sit exposed. Keiichi panics for a second, but quickly realizes that this one wasn't him. He never wished for Rika to die. But then he realizes something. The newspaper that was covering up his hatchet blade has fallen off, and Satoko sees. She, of course, immediately comes to the conclusion, you know, after hearing him confess that he killed her uncle, that he murdered Rika and now plans to do the same to her. However, she's still got heat stroke, remember? She runs, but not very well. Wait! Please, wait, Satoko! You're wrong! Th that's not it! You- you killed Takanasa! And Coach! And she said, didn't you? You killed my uncle! And then, you killed Rika! You murder! He continues to rebuff her, but she claims that he doesn't even remember half of what he's done, so how can he know that he didn't do this? After me, he went away. I was lonely for a long time, but then Keiichi san transferred to our school, and everyone was happy again. It was fun again. Every day it was beautiful. How <laughs> did it turn, it turn out, out like, like this? this? Eventually, the two make it to a suspension bridge deep in the woods. Keiji wonders again why this has all happened, why Satoko is scared of him. This insane world, where I was at the festival when I wasn't, and the uncle I killed was alive, where death would come just by wishing for it. It was this world's fault. Was the price for killing a man supposed to be this high? I did the right thing. At least, I wanted to. So then, why? 
Keiichi throws away the hatchet in order to calm Satoko down. Once she's satisfied, Satoko comes up to Keiichi from behind. I sort of think I understand that it isn't your fault, Keiichi-san. I think, probably, you have just been possessed by something evil. I understand, you know? It isn't like... I haven't experienced it myself. Sotoko then goes into a story about how one day a few years ago, she climbed to the top of the ritual storehouse. She got in by removing the grating from one of the windows, but then got stuck inside. Being the little monkey that she is, she was able to get to the roof of the storehouse. However, in the process, she accidentally damaged an image of Oyashiro-sama. The loud noises drew the priest to the storehouse, who blames Rika for Sotoko getting in because only she knows where they keep the keys. And Sotoko said nothing. So now, she believes that she is cursed. There's something I heard once! Oh, Yashiro-sama! When he really curses someone, he doesn't kill them right away! He goes in order of your closest friends, and after killing them all, he kills that person last! So, Keiichi-san, the curse got you too. Calm down, Satoko. There is no curse. Nobody is trying to torment you. He tries to turn around, but she pushes him. Hard. He nearly flies off the bridge, but manages to hang onto one of the cords on the side. Die, you murderer! Give him back! Give back my Nini! Give back Rika and Mommy and Keiichi-san! I won't... I won't lose to the likes of you! I won't lose to some stupid curse! Satoko, please, just let me say one thing. I know that what I did isn't exactly praiseworthy. But I did it because I wanted you to be happy. Please, just believe that. But Satoko isn't listening anymore. Still, he goes on and says what he wants to say. If it made you happy, that was all that mattered. We were nothing without your smile. We were nothing. If you can get on with your new life by my dying, then please, just smile. Can't you at least promise me that? She pushes him off the bridge. On the way down, Keiichi realizes something, that he has already disappeared. He disappeared on the night of Watanagashi and fell into this insane world. This year, the murder victim was Tepe Hojo, and the Onikakushi disappearance was Keiichi Maebara. He takes some comfort in the fact that in the real world, at least, Satoko must finally be free. He hits the riverbed, and with a final farewell and one final wish, he curses this whole insane town of Hinamizawa, and Keiichi loses consciousness. Keiichi wakes up. Unfortunately, he's in a lot of pain, so he gets up from the riverbed and trudges his way over to the clinic. While he's walking, he smells something odd that reminds him of... rotten eggs? And there's something else that's missing. The Higarashi. They're silent. They have been the whole time he's been awake. As it turns out, they're all dead. He comes across a pile of insect corpses. What the hell is going on here? He passes by the school, noticing how all the roads are empty, but then he finally sees something. A bunch of heavy-duty trucks. As one of them passes Keiji, he sees the label on the side. Ground Self-Defense Forces. Yeah, so these guys are from the SDF, the Japanese army. One of the soldiers approaches him, and Keiji sees that they're covered from head to toe in hazmat gear. Okay, seriously, what the hell is going on? The army guys help him put on a gas mask and stick him in the back of their truck. He wants to know what's up just as much as we do, and as it turns out, it is now June 22nd, and he's been knocked out for a whole day. They won't tell him what happened, though, but he overhears from a radio that there was a huge disaster in Hinamizawa on the night between the 21st and the 22nd. The details have not yet been investigated, but there was an eruption of volcanic gas from somewhere in the Hinamizawa area. This gas was poisonous, and it crept along the ground into the village while everyone slept. When the SDF was called in the next morning, most everybody was already dead. They make it to the clinic and force Keiji onto a stretcher with the other very few survivors, and he realizes that what the trucks were transporting were bodies. My... my final wish. Again, it was granted. As a paramedic is screaming in his ear to stay alive, Keiichi slowly loses consciousness again. Maybe it was a mistake. 
to take someone's life, even if it was to save Satoko. You don't say. If, if this is the price I had to pay, this horrible tragedy, then this is a little much, Oyashiro-sama. But it looks like there's a light at the end of the tunnel, because all day Keiji has not heard those footsteps following him, even once. The curse is broken, but a little too late for everyone in Hinamizawa. After this, we get an overview of what happened in the village. The gas leaked out from the swamp, because of course it did, and by mid-morning, everyone was dead. In the end, only one person survived the catastrophe. Keiichi Maibara. Years later, an older couple finds some belongings of their deceased son, who died in a boating accident. For many years, he was a reporter, and one of his tape recordings was apparently from the fall after the Hinamizawa disaster, and is with a certain Keiichi Maibara after he was transferred to a mental institution. Keiichi tells the reporter his story, but the reporter doesn't believe him, stating that he would have inevitably died if he was laying on the riverbed as he claims. When Keiichi tells him that he caused the curse for that year, the reporter laughs him off. You've been doing nothing but laughing in my face this whole time. I never heard the footsteps again after that day, so I don't think I have that terrible power anymore. Perhaps, right here, right now, I'll wish for you to die. Yes, this time, why don't I decide how you die? Takano-san was found burned to death, so let's go with the opposite, with water. Now then, I wonder how many days it will take you to drown. <laughs> you better be careful, you know. Don't go getting yourself killed by some stupid curse I put on you. Okay? <laughs> of course, even if it was years later, the reporter did die by drowning. But that recording is the last we ever hear of Keiichi Maibara and of Hinamizawa. So, uh, yeah. Here we are again. These videos just keep getting longer and longer, and there's nothing I can do to stop them. But I think this chapter was the longest of all for one specific reason. How real it was. I mentioned this throughout the video, but the first two chapters of Higurashi were rather fantastical. This chapter manages to pull another 180 on the reader again by changing its tone, but instead of the microcosm of the individual chapters, this tone change was on the macro level of the whole series in general. Satoko's abuse is real. It's very real, and all of the characters have to deal with the utter devastation that it causes. Chapter 3 is still very much a horror story, just like the previous two, but instead of the horror coming from absurd, horrifying situations, it stems from the fact that what is happening before your eyes can, and has, happened in the real world before, and it will happen again. And just like the characters in the story, there's often nothing you can do to help the victims, because society is organized in an incredibly bureaucratic way. Normally these rules are put in place to protect children, but there are always exceptions who slip through the cracks. Keiichi and his friends can't dismantle this broken system, of course, because they're just children. And that's the scariest part of all. That all they can do is sit and watch as their friend's soul gets destroyed. In a way, you can see why Keiichi comes to the conclusion that he does. That the only thing he can do, the only thing he has the power to do, is move outside the law and commit murder. Of course, the narrative ultimately condemns this in a very grim fairy tale like manner. Keiichi kills one person, so he gets the power to kill anyone he wants. But this power is what causes the tragedy that makes it so that the thing that he really wants, those happy days with his friends to return, can never happen ever again. This dynamic will be returned to later, and we will see how Keiichi and the crew solve this problem in a way that sticks and doesn't end in tragedy. I can at least promise you that. Satoko's story does have a happy ending, but you'll have to wait quite a while to see it. Beyond that, this chapter opened up a bunch of questions. Is that bizarre backwards world of Hinamizawa where the Oni Kakushi victims end up? Or is Keiji just going absolutely insane? And what about the great Hinamizawa disaster? We haven't seen anything like it in previous chapters, so was it just from Keiji cursing the village? There's still one more chapter to go before we start getting our answers, but it's 
rather short, so hopefully you won't have to wait as long for it. In the meantime, if you want to support me, you can, of course, head over to my Patreon, or honestly, just subscribe. Your views really mean the world to me, because I work really, really hard on these videos, and I'd love to keep making more. Until next time, make sure that you get a good night's sleep tonight. Hey everyone, welcome to the end of the video. I sincerely hope you enjoyed. I worked incredibly, incredibly hard on it. <laughs> um, I'm dead inside. Before I go, I just want to give a special shout out to my Priest of the Hog patrons. We have Noah, Adra, Kronaton, Javi Bavo, Xavier Pena, Ventus Agri, Casey and more, Eshock7, and Jonathan Hummel. Thanks again, guys. Your support means the world to me. And I'll see you all next time.